The legacy lives, let them see what the pedigree is. Mega thesis, blessing these kids, whatever the beach is, the depths are deep in, the deepest sea is. Telepathy increases, melody can speak it. Telekinesis, ideas appear as clearest. Pictures and movie theaters, lyrics you hear it. Devastating the way you hear it. So stay tuned for sequels, part twos, and more. So soon you and your people can bump, rush, and store. The names have changed, the game remain the same. I want King to reign on his claim to fame. No stopping this, I'm dropping this with hip hop in this. And when the topic gets topicless, then I'm writing the apocalypse. So all hail the honorable, microphone phenomenal, persona is vulnerable. Trust me, son, I continue like a solid dude. Bringing you the drama to allow you that the chronicle is just, just, gun, 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 gun. Peace, Peace, family. Y'all know who it is. It's Bakari Lamumba, the progenitor of LamumbaSpeaks.com, a black empowerment initiative where we believe we can gain a competitive advantage by always betting on black Appreciate you all tapping in this evening. We're going to have a great conversation, as always, a hopefully an intellectually stimulating, robust conversation regarding the husband-son crisis and the rise of the hobosexual, right? So if you're watching, make sure you hit the subscribe and like button, thumbs up, thumbs up, thumbs up, as well as the notification bell. Um, I think this is a rather important topic to have, but before we do that, I want to make sure that you like, subscribe, and share. Uh, we're going to go over some of the ground rules before we really get started and have the conversation. The link is in the description, but then I'll put the link in the chat as well before we get this started. So I was having a conversation. As many of you all know, I'm on a journey to completing my PhD. And we were having a conversation about uh, the narrative that's been narrative that's been created regarding there aren't enough available black men for black women. Uh, this is one of my classes. Um, and this concept and idea that black men aren't meeting black women where they are. And I, I pushed against that. And I even talked about this concept of the husband son. And many people are familiar with the concept of the son husband, right? The situation in which the, the child, the actual son of the mother plays the emotional husband is there for the mother emotionally the way an actual father would be. But we got into this conversation. I said, you know, that is a narrative that's, that's, that's a misnomer. I mentioned blackdemographics.com, black demographics for black people, black black people. Most of us are aware of the fact that blackdemographics.com has been cited by some noteworthy publications such as the Washington Post, New York Times, and even CNN. So I said, you know, I'm citing a source that is reputable, um, but we tend to find out that's not the case. I think it was 52, 54 percent of black men are single, middle class, and childless, right? And so I got into this concept of discussing feminism, right, and how feminism, I believe, pushes this concept of the husband-son crisis. But before I um, say that, we're going to go over some ground rules, right? So as you all know here at Lumumba Speaks, we welcome diversity of thought. So right, you don't have to agree with me lockstep. You could be completely on the other side. I have no problem with that, but I do require um, uh, so that it's not a problem. Right? Diversity of thought is welcome. You could be... Um, on the right of the other aisle or even on the left of the aisle, just come in if you can make claims that substantiate and substantiate the claims that you're making. Of course, that would be greatly appreciated. Number two, no racial epithets of any kind can be used. I don't allow racial epithets of any kind. This is a black empowerment initiative where we believe in always better on black. And as a part of that, we believe, of course, in the three ends of black power, self-respect, self-discipline, self-determination, right? Um, and so, so I'm sorry, self, self, self-respect, self self-defense and self-determination. And so as, as a result, we respect ourselves as African people. As a black people, I use that term interchangeably. And so we don't allow racial evidence of any kind, irrespective of one's political position, political ideology, or even geographic, geopolitical location, right? Number three, facts over feelings. You could come in, you can make any perspective, any argument that you want, but I do not allow people to make, um, make claims that are patently false. Number two, if we're having an intellectually stimulating conversation, uh, I would push you to make an argument against the push, fight against the argument, not the person. So attack the argument, not the person. And then, of course, last but not least, no fundamentally false statements can be made. And as I always, I always state, our mission here in the moon seeks is neither to exonerate or vilify, but to simply challenge conventional wisdom and re-examine what has been previously accepted as fact. So just want to make you all aware of that our mission is to neither 
exonerate or vilify, but to challenge conventional wisdom and re-examine what has been previously accepted as fact. So we're going to get right into it. And then I'm, I'm going to say my piece and I'm going to put the link in the chat. But when we talk about this concept of the husband, son, and the rise of the homosexual, uh, most people, I think, nowadays are at least aware of what the homosexual is. Homosexual is a um, individual, could be male or female, that seeks out a relationship with someone so that they have a place to stay, they can have a roof over their head. Right? We've seen this um, across different racial ethnic groups, even across genders, right? Man, woman, hey, I want to be in a relationship so that I can secure, that I have a place to lay my head, right? By the unfortunate, but we tend to find this, right? The second issue is this concept of the husband-son crisis, right? We are mostly familiar with the concept of the son-husband, where the son plays the emotional husband for their mother due to the absence of their father or the mother being married or in a significant relationship with someone of her age. Um, but most people may be unaware of, of this concept of the husband son, right? And so what we tend to find here is this is a situation in which, and I would even argue is fuel by feminist ideology. And I state that because as someone who works in higher ed, I've seen a number of my contemporaries and colleagues engage in this type of practice and behavior. Um, and that is, we tend to find a situation in which uh, women of means, women who uh, have attained some academic credentials, socioeconomically have developed, we tend to find a situation in which they seek out relationships with individuals who are of a lower socioeconomic position than them. They seek out relationships with individuals who are academically below them, intellectually below them. And many people would argue, why? And the reason is it gives them power and control in the relationship. It'll be extremely difficult, extremely hard for someone to, of course, um, hold you accountable for your behavior when you're taking care of them, right? Uh, so I, I, we couldn't even argue that we see this in the case of John Moran. The fact that he's financially providing for the family He's the one calling the shots and the parents don't really have the ability to what corral his behavior the way they did when he, of course, was in high school or even college. So something to be cognizant of. We're talking about the husband son crisis. Want to know if you all are familiar with the husband son crisis and, of course, this concept of the rise of the homosexual. And what we tend to find in a husband son relationship, once again, husband son, not son husband, is a situation in which the woman is particularly dominant. Um, Oftentimes there's one-way violence, right? One-way violence between from the woman to the man, right? Rather than the other way around, where we know historically men tended to be the purveyors of, of and primary perpetrators of domestic violence in the black community and society as a whole. We tend to find a situation now that in the husband-son relationship, where the man is the one who was being is dependent on the woman financially, socially, intellectually, etc. There's a one-way violence in where the woman is the one who is being verbally and physically and even emotionally abusive and manipulative. A good example is um, we tend to hear situations of, particularly like if you watch trash television with these courtroom dramas, TV courtroom dramas, where she says, I put him out, I made him sleep on the couch. Um, that's an example, in my opinion, of the husband-son crisis, right? Of a husband-son relationship. I can call, better call Joseph, appreciate you. Hope you could tap in in a minute when I open up, put the link in the chat. Um, where I've seen a situation in which uh, I had a woman try that with me. You're going to sleep on the couch tonight. And I started laughing. And I told her, you watch too much television, right? I said, there's no way that I'm going to sleep on the couch in a place where I pay the money. So a lot of that comes from the fact that a lot of men are dependent on women financially. But I also argue that a lot of women, unfortunately, nowadays tend to go out and seek out relationships with men who, of course, are not on their levels, socioeconomically, academic, or even intellectually. And then I'm, I'm going to open it up after I, I, I say this little piece. Is that I could recall when I first started my doctoral program, there was a situation in which, um, if I can remember correctly, there was a black woman who was a PhD. She was dating a man who had just recently been released from pre prison. Maybe less than a year, he had been released from prison. And the man killed her, he killed her, he killed her. Uh, he deleted her. This used the term delete, he deleted her. And it was extremely unfortunate. And there was a huge article that talked about how. She valued his humanity. That's why she chose to be in a relationship with this guy, even though he had he was a violent offender. He had a history of violent crimes and had been in and out of prison his entire adult life. 
Um, and I pushed back against that. I said, no, she did, got in a relationship with this guy. Uh, once she may be fetishized, being with someone who she considered a uh, hyper masculine. And then two, hey, if you're in a relationship with someone who's just getting out of prison, you're going to be able to call the shots. And of course, I got a lot of pushback from that in class. But I said, these are the uncomfortable truths that un most people are willing to speak and most people do not want to hear. Right. Um, and so it's unfortunate that the woman lost her life as a result. But these are some of the real world consequences that we're finding in terms of women seeking out relationships with men who are not their academic, intellectual, social, economic equal. So uh, this is what we're here to talk about, brothers and sisters. The husband son crisis, the rise of the homosexual. Uh, I'm going to put the link in the chat. Make sure you hit the subscribe, like, and share. Uh, so we're going to get things started. So put the link in the chat here regarding the husband son crisis. And we can start off. You can put a one in the chat if you are familiar, if you've heard of the concept of a husband son. And then you can put a two in the chat if you have not heard of the concept of a husband son. But once again, the link is in the chat. The link is in the description. Uh, you're watching Lumumba Speaks here on YouTube, and we're going to have a great conversation regarding the husband son crisis. And the reason why I even argue that a lot of this comes out of feminist ideology is because if you study feminism, feminism argues that um, men are oppressive by nature, right? Irrespective of someone's being a protector, et cetera, et cetera, men are oppressors. And so part of that comes in the fact that, of course, you have to use certain men, you have to compete with men, and that in order to not be oppressed, you have to put yourself in a position in which you're over men, economically, academically, intellectually, so on and so forth. I can state, as someone who works in higher ed, who's in a doctoral program, many of my colleagues, many of my compatriots uh, who are women or female, um, are feminists. And I've seen them out. In, and I, when I meet the, their, their partner or their spouse or boyfriend or whatever, extremely beta male vibes, extremely passive. Um, so it's just, it's, it's rather curious to say the least. But I think this is something that takes place on a regular basis. And I think it's done purposely. Um, I think oftentimes when women carry that type of masculine energy, they're not going to seek out a masculine man. They're going to seek, seek out a man who is a beta, someone who's a simp. And then we also can even open the conversation up to talk about why a lot of black men who aren't able to what compete in society, um, why they find themselves in these situations. So I definitely would be interested, interested in hearing what you all have to say. Excuse me. But the link is in the chat. Uh, once again, if you've heard of the concept of a husband son, put a one in the chat. If you have not heard of the concept of a husband husband son, put a put a two. And then, of course, we're going to talk about why this is a crisis. Why is this something that we're finding uh, to become more and more common? Right? We know oftentimes what we start finding is the woman is established, she has her own place, and then she gets into a relationship and she moves the man into her home. Right? And most of us know that's a recipe for disaster. If you're going to live together, you need to be two individuals who are in the, independent. Then you come to bed to come together and become interdependent. Um, but unfortunately, that is not the case. And I think a lot of that is rooted, of course, in the husband son crisis, particularly in terms of how a lot of young black men are being raised. You know, uh, Dr. Jawan Kunjufu wrote a book entitled Raising Black Boys. And he talked about that some, not all, but some, you know, it's never all, but some black. Um, Black, black mothers raise their daughters but love their sons. Their daughters are squared away. They, they, they work hard in school and they go, they go to Penn State on a full scholarship, but their son goes to the state pen. And he argues that a lot of that comes from, of course, this concept of the Willie Lynchism and slavery. And I want to protect the child and I don't want to push him or challenge him intellectually, academically. I just want to love on him. But we know the long-term ramifications of the mother's love it tends to coddle the boys and they aren't able to go out in the world and compete, let alone deal with um, adversity. I think another issue that we tend to find is, um, that's rather unfortunate is oftentimes we find a number of young men who are raised in those type of dynamics that they are emotionally fragile, right? They are, they're not used to tough love. They're not used to being able to engage in an environment in which things aren't always going away is what many people call it in the sports analogy of someone being a front runner, right? So that's something that we can unpack as well regarding why are a lot of black men, unfortunately, becoming husband sons, right? So like, as I said before, we're familiar with the son husband crisis, but uh, we're going to discuss, of course, husband sons. The link is in the chat, family. Once again, if you're familiar with the concept of a husband son, Put a one in the chat. If you have never heard of the concept of a husband son, put a two in the chat, okay? 
Uh, the link is in the chat. The link is also in the description. And we're going to have a great conversation this evening regarding the husband-son crisis family, a husband-son crisis. And want, want to make sure that everyone taps in, be part of this conversation. Then, of course, you can share. Have, is this something that you've seen maybe socially in your family? Uh, have you been adjacent to these type of issues? And, of course, we can talk about what are some of the causes of the husband-son crisis as well as what are some of the solutions, right? But I would dare say, and I've seen this, of course, in my work, that oftentimes uh, when some, a man is in a husband-son situation, uh, unfortunately, oftentimes the woman, irrespective of racial back, racial background, doesn't want that man to what develop because then, of course, you may not be able to control him, right? You will become what many would call intractable, right? So something to consider. Um, but once again, we're looking to have a great conversation regarding the husband-son crisis and the rise of the hobosexual. If you do not know what a hobosexual is, a hobosexual is an individual who seeks out relationships uh, so that they can have a place to stay, a roof over their head. Um, and so this is something that we're seeing a lot, unfortunately, particularly with a black man, right? So we definitely want to unpack why black men are struggling, uh, quote unquote, struggling the way they are in society. Uh, we know Dr. Francis Cross Wilson talks about it's important to empower black men because if you destroy black men, you destroy black people. Dr. Dr. Francis Cross Wilson also argued, of course, in her book, The ISIS Papers, similar text to ISIS Papers, this concept and idea of if you destroy black men, you destroy, destroy black people's ability to reproduce, of course, right, uh, to reproduce. Um, and this concept of sexual violence, particularly behind bars, Fannie Lou Hamer even talked about how uh, she saw a black man being abused by police while she was incarcerated for her civil rights activism, her revolutionary civil rights activism, that oftentimes what would take place as a result is that the black CEO, but well, the CEOs would oftentimes stump on and try to beat on the black man's testicles and, of course, his phallus. We even see and we are familiar with the situations in which when black men were lynched, and even I would dare say even black women, their genitalia was literally stripped, cut from their body, put in jars and used as carried as souvenirs. So there's an issue even here with some sexual uh, predation in terms of the violence that was afflicted towards black men and black women. But that may be a conversation for another day. But something just to be cognizant of when we talk about maybe maybe some of the reasons that we tend to find uh, black men not being able to, quote unquote, um, hold up their end of the bargain, right? In terms of what is expected out of men in society and in particular, the black community. Some would even argue that uh, maybe there should be a, a redefining of what some of the expectations are. Um, I'm someone who's not supportive of that. I believe that we should never, never, ever um, fall prey to the soft bigotry of low expectations. I think uh, I can recall I gave a talk at a university and I talked about a few. This was uh, to a group of white educators and administrators, K through 12. So we're talking about secondary uh, educators. And I told them, if you want to help black children, you challenge them intellectually, right? You don't help black children. You don't help black youth. You don't help black men or black women or black boys and girls by what lowering the standards, lowering expectations, and coddling them intellectually, particularly intellectually, even emotionally, right? Because we know when we get out into the real world, a world that, of course, is oftentimes shaped, is shaped and defined by white hegemony, it, it won't coddle them in any way, shape, or form. So we have to compare, prepare them for uh, what Doc, for, uh, for what uh, Paul Robeson calls uh, the battlefront is everywhere. There is no shelter in rear. And we need to go out, prepare our young people to go out into the world and be cognizant of the fact that the battlefront is everywhere. There is no sheltered rear. So uh, with that being said, once again, we're going to have a conversation this evening regarding the husband-son crisis. We're talking about the rise of the homosexual. Once again, as I stated before, please put a one in the chat. If you have, if you are cognizant of the term husband-son, put a two in the chat. If you have never, uh, if you are unaware uh, of the concept of a husband-son, and for those of you who do not know, a husband son is someone who plays the role of the child, I dare say, in the relationship. We're familiar with the son-husband, the situation in which the, the, the son plays the emotional husband for their mother due to the absence of the father of the woman having a rather uh, serious relationship with one of her contemporaries, male contemporaries. Um, but we tend to find the husband son, and this is a situation in which 
many women would go out and purposely, keyword is purposely, uh, seek out relationships, dalliances, situationships, or even maybe romantic entanglements uh, with men who are not their social, economic, academic, or intellectual equal. Um, the argument that is being made, particularly from a Black male studies perspective, is that this is done so that they can wear the pants in a relationship and oftentimes dominate the man who they are with. Um, as you can see on the actual um, screen, uh, the cover art I have for this video, we see a picture of the, from the film Norbit, in which, of course, Norbit was dependent on Respucia. I hope I'm saying the name right. Financially, as a result, she was, of course, extremely demeaning, and degrading, and so on and so forth. So definitely something to be cognizant of when we talk about the husband-son crisis. So, Sister Michelle, I'm going to have you tap in. What's the Hi, word? How are you? Yeah, I'm going to cry about a long time no see. Yeah, I'm going to go um, stop the cam now. All right, no problem. Yeah, um, as a social worker, especially when I was doing outreach work, I've noticed yeah. um, a lot of my a lot of my clients that I was working with who had Section 8, um, these were women who were possibly over 30, a lot of them had access to men that were younger than them. Mm-hmm. And they always had a significant other mm. because of the housing, you know, housing, you know, cost. So they will have, like you said, the entanglements, the situation where this man may have another lady, but because she has a place he knows or his mom or grandma gets kicked out or he can always go there and stay and stay for a little while. Do you understand? The yeah, so he will some of the he some, the few I knew he was smart enough to kind of keep tabs on her so he knew if he ever needed a place they needed a place they can go stay there because they were living in reduced housing or section eight type of housing mm -hmm. and that's why I feel this is my theory is that's why you've seen historically you would see women with um a whole bunch of children and no daddy okay because I've noticed when I work with the families, this is just my theory. I have no research. Again, she had a stable place to stay. And, right. And he could come in. And because there's no forces to keep the man accountable in terms of being present for the children and her accountable too, everybody's leaving the life they want to live. Right. And you know something it's that we, systematic, and it's to me it's systematic. Okay. It's and, systematic. And so I, had, I had a client. I had a client. She was forty. This was a few years ago. She was like forty six. Met some guy on a, a online chat group. He was twenty six. Mm. Okay. He was. She was just maybe a few years older than one of her kids. Wow. Okay. And when I met the guy, guy's a nice guy. What mm. his Easter was, he was living with his grandmother and things. And things at home with the grandmother wasn't working out. So he moved in with her. Nice mm -hmm. guy. Um, you know, got a job while she was with she helped him get a job, helped him get on his feet. They lived like a family. Like, you know, he was a nice guy. He you know, I, I wanted to know, you know, again, I, he wasn't my client per se. She was, but, mm -hmm. and I'm seeing this, I'm like, and I'm looking at her, like, he's 20-something years old. He's going to want a life of his own, but mm -hmm. she, you know, he needs a place to stay. And, you know, we live in a D.C. area at that time. Rents are sky, rents are sky high. She, you know, she's doing everything. She makes all the major decisions. He doesn't have to right. really think too much out the box. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm saying. Husband, son, just he's the son in the relationship, and she calls yeah. all the shots. Yeah, yeah, husband, son, absolutely. So, and then the, the situation dynamic got a little, you know, the daughter gets pregnant, so now she's about to be a grand, I mean, grandmother, and I'm like, there was a situation where in the house where she was mistaken for some. It was, yeah, it was an interesting. Um, family dynamics i'm not sure where they are today but yeah and, and, um, and so this tends to happen purposely why 
because the woman knows, hey, I will be the one in the driver's seat. I will be driving the bus. Mm -hmm. And at any time, if he seeks to what? Make a decision of his own, buck my authority, right? Buck my authority. Yes. As if he's the child in the relationship, he's the son, you can tell him to get out. And he had no, he had nowhere to go. And I, I'm like, dude has no, literally had nowhere to go. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So let me ask you this. Have you, had you ever heard of this concept of the husband son? Oh yes. I've seen it. Okay. Okay. Got you. <laughs> and so what, what do you think this stems from? Uh, breakdown of our family structure. How so? Um, back in the day, I was talking to one of my clients, you know, clients, you know, mm -hmm. I've worked with clients in different, you know, generations, you know, and she got married in the early 1960s because she, she got pregnant, shotgun way. So the family was like, um, who, who, how did you, you know, you pregnant? Who's, you know, who did this? Who the daddy? Yeah. So the men of the, her, her, the men of the uncle went to, they knew the guy because, you know, that time back we, st we stayed more together. Okay, you're the daddy. They talked to his family. What you going to do about this? So they were kind of pressured to get married. <laughs> okay. Okay, so that's the that's the, to me that was our internal child support system. <laughs> right, absolutely right. You, you, you are you are going to be required to be responsible. Absolutely. Okay, but then as you know, the 1970s came, so we lessened up. You can go to you know just take the man to court. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that's where the ugliness to me begins. Got you. Well, and so, yeah, so just unpack that. You stated in the 1970s, and I, I would presume that you're referring to uh, LBJ's Great Society. Uh, exactly, exactly. Okay. Um, so just unpack that for a second. So you say that that's where things went wrong. But in the reason well, theory, I haven't researched anybody, so please, this is just my theory. Just put right, it no, no, it's, 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 it's quite all right. So a lot of people make the argument that the Black family is under attack, and that the black family has been under attack. It's, it's the black family being under attack. It's a historical as well as contemporary phenomenon, right? Yes, definitely. Um, of course, we know what took place during the Holocaust of enslavement, right? But then many people make the argument that even doing after the Holocaust of enslavement, right? You know, W. B. Du Bois rather poetically and eloquently stated that when we had um, uh, Juneteenth, right? We had our day of jubilee. Right, and then we went right back into, of course, in servitude. And of course, this is what he was referring to was what? Uh, sharecropping, right? Um, and then we had convict leasing and even black codes and Jim Crow. And then we know we were looking at state-sanctioned violence against African-Americans. And then, of course, even extrajudicial violence. Well, extrajudicial violence and then, of course, white vigilantism. Folks out here acting like they Bruce Wayne, real life, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> um, and so that, that's played a role in, of course, the disruption of the black family unit. But we find that even during these times, the, the two-parent household rate in the black community was, was upwards of 80%, right? But then the Great Society comes along, and then we see that 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 in a matter of uh, just one decade, one, I'm sorry, one generation, 20 years, it had plummeted rather precipitously. Um, but then many people would even make the argument that black families are under attack because of the what rapacious nature of the criminal justice system. I tend to push back against that. I say yes. I would. I think Amnesty International uh, documents that maybe roughly five percent of all those who are incarcerated are incarcerated due to the fact that they are in it are innocent and are of course incarcerated. Um, the, but the majority of people who are in prison are of course uh, they're guilty, right? And so the argument I make is, well, you can't argue that people are going out and committing crimes and then being held accountable for the crimes that they committed. That somehow that is. Uh, working against the, the black family structure. If anything is working against the black family structure, is an individual who is choosing to engage in criminal activity. What do you say to that? I, I agree to that point because we don't have a community of, of account internal accountability. They took mm -hmm. that away with us and they did that through the woman. I, you know, if what so I'm, I'm going to need you to break that down. You said they, they took away accountability and they did that through the woman. What do you mean? And are you saying that women are intrinsically unaccountable is no that, no, I never said no, 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 I, no 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 the thing is as a woman i will have to consult with like an auntie or consult with a grandmother consult with some type of womanly figure within my circle now you go to school there's counselors you go to here there's that and you they're telling you okay you you can go to social security 
you can go to the court system. Mm -hmm. But nobody's looking at the bigger picture of all this. Where is this going to lead you? Okay. Do, do you understand what I'm trying to say? Got you. Okay. Um, go right ahead. So, you know, Auntie may say that dude over there, he's no good now. Everybody, now, um, you know, then when you go to school or when you go to the social systems, they're telling you you have a right to make your decision. But yes, you have a decision, but they don't like to talk about how your decision impacts yourself and the family which supports you. No discussion about that. Right. <laughs> okay. Okay. And to me, that to me, that is a segue of how LGBT now is a concern for our community because they systematically uh, deteriorated us. Now, LGBT uh, things are coming in and we can't even fight it because we didn't handle it when we needed to be handled. So, uh, I, so could, could you elaborate on what you mean by that? Uh, again, like like I said, again, if something were, as a woman, if I'm going through something or if I'm dating someone, you know, so at some point I have to bring him to meet my family, bring him to meet somebody within my circle. Now, I don't have to bring him around nothing. <laughs> and vice versa, as a man, I can do what I want to do. There's no mm -hmm. level of accountability. Okay. Because society has told us it's your right, live your life. And so when something goes wrong, I go to the social services, I go to the court system. And these entities do not have your best interests at heart in the long run. Okay. Okay. I think I think most people would agree with that. Um, and I I so I, I come recall uh uh, I did a show on ratchet feminism. I don't know if you was here for that show, if you tapped in for that show, but if you haven't, you could go back in the, my Rolodex on YouTube and you could find that show on ratchet feminism. But I brought this up to my class. So as, as I think I told you, I teach African American mm -hmm. history. And uh, there's, there's a queer woman, a white woman who's queer, who's in my class. And we talked about ratchet feminism. And she and the, she said, well, I don't see what the problem is with ratchet feminism. Oh, boy. Okay. Mm. And uh, I said, well, here's the thing. A person can behave whatever way they want, but the outcomes that you get are the outcomes that you get, right? Now, I said from a community standpoint, if I'm out engaging in racially disempowering, self-defeating, and self-destructive behavior, that is going to negatively affect my community, right? Because I'm not I'm not living out on some island in the, in the, in the South Pacific, right? To where my actions don't affect anyone else. So I said, these are some of the things that we have to become cognizant of. And I would argue that as African people, we've gotten away from some of our traditional value with values, which is being meaning being communalistic. Mm -hmm. Right. And so but when I, you take on this, go right ahead. Oh, I, I'm sorry, brother. I, I got excited when you said that um, statement. And I didn't mean to interrupt you. Our community, our community communalistic terms was our wealth. And we lost it and they knew it. They knew it. Once they broke down our communities, they took away our wealth. And unfortunately, we have allowed European standards to define what wealth is, what our value systems are. Now we're facing, I hate to say this, extermination, slowly but surely. Well, and, and I would say this, and this is just an argument I'm making, part of this is because I work in high red. I think that some of this is rooted, of course, in feminist ideology. So what we tend to find is that any type of values that is supposed to uh, curb or curtail or, or human behavior, it's seen as problematic, it's seen as controlling, and it's seen as being rooted in patriarchy, right? So, no, but I tell people, okay, fine, you take this feminist concept, you go out and you could just do whatever the hell you want, but, the con but then when you suffer the consequences of your actions, then you're arguing, hey, no one was here to protect me. Where is the black community? And so I said, you can't go out and be vulgarly individualistic, but then expect the community to have your back when you're out causing problems that could have been prevented if you listened to someone. Yes, yes. And I, and I, uh, speaking of which, you just brought to my Amber Rose. I wish those babies' father would go get their damn kids. Uh, so I'm not familiar with with the Amber Rose situation. She, you, Amber Rose, she's right? telling about she's you know she 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 tells her son what she you know she's trying to raise her son to be a feminist. I'm like what? Oh yeah 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 okay yeah yeah I think I think she had I think I saw that she has a OnlyFans 
I yeah. her son came out defending it, like let her live her best life. The yeah, just absolutely ridiculous. Like, so one, a child of that age, and I, I'm assuming the child was maybe eight or nine, should not even be cognizant mm -hmm. of the fact that you are even engaging that type of behavior, right? So when we say a child is supposed to stay in a child's place, part of it is that you don't bring children into adult conversations and mm -hmm. bring them into adult content, right? Mm -hmm. For example, I can recall uh, growing up, we would have family movie nights. If there was a sexual scene, my dad would speed through it, right? <laughs> <laughs> he would speed through it. Like, we know what's going on. He would fast forward that thing, right? This is back when we had VCRs, mm -hmm. right? Um, so that, that, that's an issue. The second issue I want to speak to is this concept of the father needs to go get the child. And that sounds good, but we know the reality is most men are encumbered by the, by the family court system. And the level of discrimination that men face is... But then where, were you, where was your discernment? See, and this is... And this is where... And that's why we need like a manhood society, black manhood society or group or something. Right. Because I, I, I know what you're going to say, and I would agree. Why would you have a child with someone like that? Well, she, 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 she was walking. She was in that life way before you met her. You knew what she right. was about. It wasn't like she hid it. Right. I, and, I, and I would agree with you. I would agree with you 100%. You know, I even told my son, I said, never in your life uh, move in with a woman. Ever. I told him this when he was like six years old. I said, I got to drill this in your head. Right. And I said, two, don't date a woman who has children. Okay. And I told him, I said, there's a number of things that will come as a result of you dating a woman who has children. I said, one, there will be an expectation. It will be, it be either be implicit or explicit that you provide your time, money, and emotional, uh, and provide emotional labor for the child. That is okay. your and, and, and that is true because I saw that with that 26 year old. But hold on, hold on, let me, let me. And then there's also oftentimes, more often than not. That woman is going to try to triangulate some drama between you and the child's father. I told my son, I said, I'm telling you, most women, okay, not all, but most women who are baby mamas, once they get into a relationship, they become extremely disrespectful towards the father of their child because the belief in the mindset is, I have a man here who would defend me and take up for me, even if I'm in the wrong. And the reason why women believe that is because I think most women know that a man who will be in a relationship with me and help me take care of my child is a fucking simp. I think you go, I, I, because because of we are people we need, uh, that are in need of repair. And like, I wouldn't want like like 26 year old. Now he's, he's practically a grand, he's he didn't even become a parent. He became like a grandparent. I mm -hmm. mean, if this, <laughs> he skipped that role. <laughs> then, then it will, we, we, again, we need some type of repair. So a woman doesn't get, pre you know, well, so ingrained in her. So she does understands the importance of saving her. Well, so here's, so here's the thing with that. Right? I don't want, I don't want the issues. I, 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 hear, I hear you, but this is the thing. We live in a first world country. Women have as many rights, if not more rights than men nowadays. This isn't Afghanistan. This isn't North Korea. This isn't Iran. A woman can do whatever the hell she wants. Appreciate you designing. You said this is a good topic. I hope you could tap in and be part of the conversation, brother. Um, and a woman can do whatever the hell she wants. We find nowadays to where women know that it's extremely difficult to have children uh, and be a single mother. We find nowadays that women will, are cognizant of the fact that raising a child as a single mother is the worst statistical outcome for the child. And they would do it anyway simply because they want to. And there's nothing that anyone could do to stop them. But then but then what we should do, um, I have a friend, she's from I think Syria alone. When mm -hmm. her mother, yeah. when she became when her her mother was like a young was a teen mother, she wasn't raised by her mother. Once she became of age, she was sent to live with her uh her, her father's family. Mm -hmm. I think if we were to institute that here, that would make a lot of women think. And, and, and I'm with you, but here's the thing. That child wouldn't live with the, the father's family because the mother was willing to oblige. Right? Here's the reality of the situation. Most women who are baby mothers aren't going to do that because they know they're getting certain resources called child support. I know of a situation, personal situation. This is anecdotal. This brother's brilliant. He's a director of a department at an institution of higher education. His sons were flunking out of school. They literally were flunking every grade, every subject. 
He went and got his children, took them on, raised them full time. They became A and B students, honor roll students. Same school, same teachers, same neighborhood. But of course, because of the discipline and structure and the accountability and authority in the home, the children excelled academically. And but he still had to pay child support to the mom. She's like, I don't care. You could come and get them, but I'm not going to take you off of child support. So we see these type of things. But right? then that also speaks to our economic disadvantages that has been placed on us. Well, well I, I would push back. Hold, 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 hold on, hold on. I would push back against that. I would okay. argue that it isn't rooted in just fi fi financial difficulties because the sister was doing well uh, financially. It's simply to the fact that one greed, a extra money. And the fact that hey, I want to screw the screw the screw the father. Yeah, because he did. He uh, were they married? Uh, well, actually, they had two children, and then she told him a week before their wedding that she didn't want to be married anymore, uh, get married, and that she wanted to dissolve the relationship. Wow. Yeah, yeah. And then, and, and it's you know what he says? She's for the streets. <laughs> <laughs> and, and this, these, these are, and these are the issues. We don't have a culture of marriage anymore. This is true. Um, so, uh, and I'm seeing it as I'm seeing young girls coming up, mm -hmm. and it's worrying me because nobody is preparing for that that stage in life when you're going to have to share, you know, your time, your space, responsibility, come together and grow. We lost that art form. Again, you got people coming from the South who, who barely third grade education, but stay together for 40, 50 years. And you got these highly, so-called highly educated people, like you said, just before the wedding, called it quits. Well, I mean, and, and, and a lot of that is just rooted in the fact that people are vulgarly individualistic nowadays. But that, vulgarly individualistic to their detriment. Yeah, I, I would agree. And I would argue, and many people push back against this, but a lot of this is rooted in feminism. I mean, of because course, yes. uh, feminist discourse, and I even had some, I have some literature, to, of course, to my to my right here on feminism that talks about that um, having a family is oppressive to a woman, being married is oppressive to a woman, having a child is oppressive to a woman, even engaging in consensual sexual activity for a woman is oppressive in the act of violence. So if you internalize these concepts and ideas. You would see a family not as something that is actually a benefit, not as something that actually is will protect you, but as something that is, of course, uh, what detrimental to your very existence. Zongo Native says individualism is part of American culture. I agree wholeheartedly. I would argue that this concept of individualism, this concept of feminism, as opposed to Africana womanism, is rooted in, of course, African people here in America, here in America, here in the West, here in the West, adopting the values, attributes, and beliefs of our oppressors okay but then also you also okay let's if we can rewind a little bit on the feminism part the feminism was really an issue of the white men and white women They're, that's their problems yeah facts. We, but and then we then we have taken on the feminism and projected it in our in our community in our society right matter of fact there's a great book uh by a scholar robert staples he wrote a book called the urban plantation and he talked about the the fallacy of black patriarchy, right? And he talks about there are only two black institutions in, in the black community in black America that are independently ran by black people without white interference or funding. He says the black church and the black household, the family. He says in the household, black men aren't there because 80% of black children are being raised by female headed households. So there can't be a patriarchy if you aren't even there, right? And then he said, second, in the church, uh, black men, black women make up the majority of the parishioners of, of, of black churches, mm -hmm. but black men make up the majority of those in leadership positions. But he stated that that only takes place because black women are accept that, and that if black women wanted to lead the black church or create their own churches, there's nothing that man would do to be able to stop them. That's, oh, I agree. So once again, it's like, well, what the bleep are you talking about? Mm -hmm. Again, I think it gets to. Uh, Black women and our turn our self hate in terms of trying to take on the white woman's role and position, mm -hmm. but we got it all wrong. Mm -hmm. Our our power is it through our family system. Our power is through our family structure. Right. And what has happened because we, especially in the past, I would say almost hundred years. 
we've been chipped away in terms of economical building ourselves up economically. And so what happens is sometimes the man becomes unemployed. The man's land gets taken away. Woman's looking at the man, you know, we're fussing and fighting. She got eight kids. Things get a little hard, you know, there's not enough food. So the great society and all these other entities come in and say, hey, like, you know, hey, you know, we got this for you. We can do this for you. You don't have to worry about, you know, being sexually available. You don't have to worry about putting, you know, cooking dinner, all those, all those burdens. And so we gravitated to those social systems and projected to onto our children to say, hey, you don't have to do this. You got options now. You know, you can get a nice job in the city. You can have access to a car. You know, you, you can be mobilized without this man figure. But at the same time, as if you're still a human being and you still need companionship. And number two, I had uh, when I was doing hospice, I had a lady who was in her mid 40s, came down with a terminal cancer. So, so sad. Very smart lady. Uh highly educated, got all the credentials anyone could have, had a high level type of job without, you know, kind of want to reveal no nothing, but she died alone, alone. She had family, she had family out of state. They couldn't make it out there. And I remember her revealing to me that at one point she did have someone, but again, she put her career aspirations in front of that relationship. Now you in your forties and you died alone. See, nobody talks to you about that, that stuff. And it's real. And, and here's the wild thing, because like I said, I, I work in higher ed and I've, I've come across um, numerous non-Black women who have PhDs, they have careers, and they're married. But they're, and they're married. They, they like shit. They got married in, in grad school or right after undergrad and went on to pursue their career, but made sure they were married first. Yeah, but again, that, that situation with that sister early, for, you know, in the 40 range, early, mm-hmm. she wasn't even 45, I would say. And you died alone because you, I, I get, I don't know what, what the circumstances of that relationship was, but again, as I know what she shared that, and I think, you know, as you know, you're sick and you're going through that reflection, you know, what could I have done differently? Mm-hmm. Now you're alone. Because where, where were the people from her job? You know, all these things, see, you, we got to start thinking. All those people that you working with, when it's really time for those intimate needs, care needs, they're not going to be there. It's your there. family. Right. Very true. Very true. It's going to be your family. Absolutely. So listen, family, if you're watching, tap in the link. I'm going to put the link in the chat one more time. The link should also be in the description. Uh, we're having a conversation regarding the husband, son, crisis uh put a one in the chat if you're cognizant of the term husband son and the two of you are not we're talking about the husband son crisis and the rise of the hobosexual uh, as you do not know the husband son um phenomenon is a situation in which a woman of higher social economic intellectual and academic status pursues purposely pursues a relationship with a man of a lower status uh, in, a, in, in a manner in which she can dictate to the, to, to the man in a manner as if that man is her son. So we're talking about the husband, son, crisis, Zongo native states. He put a two in. He had never heard of the husband, son crisis. But now that I've explained what the husband, son crisis is, Zongo native, have you seen this take place before? In which there's a woman of higher social, economic, intellectual, and academic status uh, pursuing a relationship with a man of lower status than treating him as if he is her son. So I'll put that question out on the Zongo Native, but the but the actual audience as well. If you're watching, make sure you subscribe, like, and share. Hit that notification bell for future videos. So we're back at it, Sister Michelle. You are you made the statement that the way to solve this problem is to reconstitute the black family. Black community. Black community. Okay, go right ahead. What, what do you mean? Like once a young lady becomes of age or a young man comes of age, there's a female group, there's a male group, how we want to design it to fit our needs as a people. Mm-hmm. So there's like a coming of age uh, pathway. 
Um, I also, I think, would help with social emotional um, concerns, um, a- affirmations. It will also help with uh, self esteem. Again, we're, we're living in a society where, where everything is not geared towards you and you feel it and you know it. Yes, mm-hmm. we have made great pathways as a people, but we're still missing something and lacking something as a, especially a black child comes of age. And to your point back to the topic, here in the DC area, a young boy was shot about a few months ago because he was stealing cars in the middle of the night, like four o'clock in the morning. Right. So the mother gets on TV and says this 13 year old child was the man at the house. Wow. Yes. Get the bleep out of Dayton. Okay. I some, in fact, she said something about he's the man at the house. Wow. If, 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 now, if, you know, if I'm wrong, I'm wrong. But I believe I, my, if my memory serves me correct, she said something to the fact that this young boy, 13 something years old, was like a, the man of the house. Mm. Because his father so was killed. His father was killed. 13 year old to provide financially for the family. He wasn't. Yeah. That's what it sounds like to me. It 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 was horrible. I, I looked at, and then I think they backtracked it. You know, they tried to do a PR role. And again, this comes from us not having order within ourselves, order within our community. Whether you like it or not, you need a certain level of order. And what this society has done is told us we can live life the way we want to. But spiritually, that's not how we were meant to live. Right. And, you know, and I think, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm an atheist. So when it comes, I'm not in the spookism, but. Um, I, didn't, I didn't say Jesus or anything. No, I, didn't no, say no, all no, that. No, no. I, I know, but when I say uh, being an atheist, I'm referring to any, I'm mm-hmm. talking about religion, spirituality of any kind, but go, go right ahead. I don't think that's how we were meant to live. Gotcha. You, know, you, you, you do need a spouse. You do need that protection. And protection can come from somebody, you know, Showing their caring for you, somebody, and, and, and that, that's rather interesting because Kiki Palmer, she just went did like a TikTok or uh, Instagram live post because you know she just had a baby. Yes, and she was talking about how you know wow, like you know uh, being a single mother, you know, it's a, she's only been a, probably a mother for like a week, and she's already talking about how difficult it is, how hard it is being a single mother. Where's the father? I thought the guy she was having a baby with was with her at least. Well, I, they were in a relationship, but they aren't married. So the, I guess the assumption or presumption is that they aren't cohabitating. I don't know. But what this speaks to is how single motherhood is oftentimes pedestalized in our black community. But then when the, the, but the reality of it isn't something that is discussed. Right? The fact that, hey, you are the primary caregiver 24-7, 365. You have no help. And then oftentimes what women do to try to what circumvent the fact that they're single parents, they move some random guy in the house. Mm-hmm. And we got to be honest here, because we know, and that's the that's the number one cause of what? Children being physically or sexually abused. Yep. The mother brings someone into the home. And we and what we do know is that the 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 lowest likelihood of a child being physically or sexually abused is when a child's biological father is in the home. Yep, absolutely. The lowest likelihood of a child being a victim of physical or sexual abuse is when a the biological father is in the home. So once again, as Dr. T. Hassan Johnson talks about, uh, the feminist ideology and propaganda and narrative of, of men being dangerous to their own children and their families, is the, the data doesn't support that. The data doesn't support that. And so the argument that T, Dr. T. Hassan Johnson makes is that feminism for many people is like a religion. If they say it, it has to be true. Even if the, even if the facts, data, and statistics doesn't support the claim that they're making. In fact, we actually find, based on studies and research and even criminal, uh, I mean, uh, uh, oh, every year, you know, after the years over, they show like the amount of people who've been charged with particular crimes, women, and this may push some people, some sisters on the channel the wrong way, but mothers are more likely to be abusing their children than fathers. The data oh, yeah. shows that. Yeah, because the mother's frustrated, so she beats him a little, you know. Yeah. I mean, a good example would be what took place in Baltimore when Freddie Gray was killed. 
And the her mother beat him out in the street like that. Yeah, and she was cursing out her son, punching him upside the head. A father would have simply more than likely what took a son said, let's go. Very yeah. simple. But then my dad did that before. When I was a teenager, something was going on. My dad showed him was like, get in the car. <laughs> that was that simple. He didn't put his hands on me, he didn't curse at me or anything. But and that's another issue. That's why the community needs to evolve. Will be uh, uh, some type of male figure needs to be involved. I wish we could implement a system. And Dr. Umar got a lot of slack when he said when he called out professional men. I I know I even had to tell you know he had to put you know push mm -hmm. back a bit because professional men. I've seen professional men try to step up, but again the systems that are in place pushes you back. Well, well, I would say this: it's not it's not even the systems, right? First off, I, I disagree wholeheartedly. Just because I'm a professional, I'm not about to go out and take care of somebody else's child. That's nonsensical. No, I'm not saying just go and take somebody's randomly child. We, again, if we had a community and system, and, and um, again, systems in place. I'm using the word system generically, mm -hmm. uh, culturally, where a man of 35, you're seen as a father figure. Now, mm -hmm. I'm saying you have your individual family, but because of the crisis we're in as a black community, now we're going to make sure you know you don't have anything in the background. You don't know, like. Not a touchy feely type of person. <laughs> <laughs> I was hoping you was gonna bring that up for real, you know, right? Because you because you know there are individuals out here who have ulterior motives. Yes, you got to so, keep it real. Oh, I want to help the children. Bullshit! You a pedo. Mm -hmm. Can't run that damn game on me. But see, here's, this is why I push back against that because these women who are single mothers wouldn't need to be relying on the community if they simply would be with the man that they had a child with. Okay. We don't need all. You don't have to have all of that. You just do things the right way. And you have to do it the right. And it has to be. Yeah. Again, and that's how to put a burden on me because you, because you decided to operate in a manner that is out of order. Yeah. And then, it was, then it was up to us. And then I have, I have to accept. Then it was up to us as a group of women to guide that young lady and say, hey, I know you, you must have over, over there with Zeke. Um, you on birth control? Um, yeah, and like know. I said, okay, fool, you can be with whoever you want, you can sleep with whoever you want, but don't get pregnant by him. Mm -hmm. It's that simple. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, and this is why I push back against that because this is what happens. And I understand this concept of community, being African centered, I understand that. We know the third principle of Kwanzaa, uh, Ujima teaches us this to collect the work and responsibility to make our brothers and sisters' problems our problems and solve them together. But the, but the, it, it goes both ways. It also states you don't go out causing problems and then expect the community to help you solve them. Okay, that, but that's why you, that's you what can't go did. out and be a provocative victim and then when you get your ass kicked, say "Go avenge me." <laughs> you, see, you see what I'm saying? It doesn't work that way. And so what happens is you have individuals who are being vulgarly individualistic, but then as soon as something bad happens, or they have to deal with the consequences of their what behavior. Then I believe in these African center values, community, 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 come help me. Don't work that way. The other issue when I tell men, I go, I tell men not to do help women who are single mothers is because in some states, if you provide emotional or financial support for a child for a significant period of time, as significant as what is ever deemed significant by the court, you could be put on child support. The second yeah. issue is I, I make the rather uh, the, my theory, my argument, and this is rather provocative and audacious, is that one of the reasons why women um uh, so love asked asked the question are women homosexuals? I'm gonna get to that in a second. Um is the reason why I think women have such a cavalier aspect and uh, attitude towards having children out of wedlock, because they know they can find some simp who's gonna go and take care of a kid that ain't theirs. But some of that simp also didn't have a daddy figure. Once again, it's still simping. He didn't have a daddy figure because you see it. He, you see it. Right, because I know I, I, my parents are still married to this day. My dad said, "Don't you, you do some shit like that? I smack the shit out of you." Mm -hmm. <laughs> you, you know what I'm saying? But well, my question to you now that you you have your two children, would you marry a woman with a child? Because you have your own kids now and bring it. I, I, I've never dated a woman with children ever in my life. Ever. So, so, so what, what? So my question to you: You have two grown. You have two. You know, almost grown children. Yeah. It's not like you're 25, no kids. I understand. But now that you have your own, and maybe she has her maybe one. I don't play those type of games. So now, oh, see, see, so 
I, because here's, the, here's the thing. I'm not going to provide in any way, shape, or form for so something. Why, you, why would you expect? An, well, I, you I have don't. Children now. You have I don't. Children. I don't expect anyone to help me with my children. I, I don't. I don't mean to put you on the spot. I'm sorry. No, no. Why, why do you think I'm by myself? I'm not looking for someone to help me raise my kids. Nor what mm -hmm. I know. Nor what I ask. The, the other issue is, oftentimes, and I'm gonna get to you, Sister Ash, once again, is that when these concepts of blended family. I know I'm a parent. I have my own biological children. You're not going to love someone else's children the way you, because they're not yours, the way you would love your own. Of this course not. Reality. I would never expect this that. This is why they say they treated me like a stepchild, right? So I don't play those type of games. The other issue is, it's a, I, I don't believe in being disingenuous with children. What I mean by that is, the only reason why a man would be playing the role of acting like he's a father to that child, that young boy, young girl, is because they're having conjugal relations with the mother. And the minute she, that, that box dries up, the minute that, that Pacific Ocean turns into the Sahara Desert and ain't no more ocean spray going on, he ain't going to be around. Yep. You see what I'm saying? Yep. So I don't, I don't play those type of games. Me, I'm divorced. I'm going to be there for my children to the day I D.I.E. You see what I'm saying? So I, I, don't, I don't play those type of games. I, and I don't believe in a blended family because, I, once again, a person could come in, say, oh, I love your kids, so on and so forth. And, but they, they aren't required to support them socially, emotionally, financially, or any other kind of way. And then, boom, they're gone. Now the children are worried about abandonment issues. I bonded with this person, and now they're gone. I don't see them anymore. So I'm, I'm cognizant of those things, right? So real quick, and then we're going to get to the chat. And you all can tap in and be part of the conversation. The link is in the chat. The link is in the description. But so are women homosexuals who are... A homosexual sexual is not gender exclusive. Anyone could be a homosexual if they're seeking a relationship in order uh, to have a place to stay, right? It's usually for women, it's called sugar babies. Okay, got you. Um, so love, ass, shit, no blended family. That is correct. I don't play those games. Um, and Zongo Native says, can you marry a single mother and still choose not to take care of her child? Well, it would be extremely awkward, right? You in the home and then you... I, I just like I said, I don't put myself in those type of situations. There are certain things I will do and certain things I won't do, and that's just not something that I would ever do in any way, shape, or form for any reason. I would hang myself with wax dental floss before I become a step parent, literally, not figuratively. I don't play those games at all, right? And secondly, I think it's just it, 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 it is disrespectful not only to the actual father who's been daddy since day one, been daddy since the moment he impregnated the mother, been daddy since the day the child popped out, started crying, is I need my diaper changed. It's also disrespectful to the institution of fatherhood because it treats fatherhood as something that is fluid and fathers as something, someone who is what fathers as fungible, fluid and fungible. So Mary Shy said, no good stepfathers. I'm quite sure there are men who are good stepfathers, but it still undermines the institution of fatherhood because it treats fatherhood as something that is what? Fluid. And as we know, most women nowadays, they um, operate under the mantra of whoever I'm in a relationship with, that's who the father is. This is the reality. Like literally, I've, I've been out here. Whoever they're in a relationship with, that's who the daddy is. So- Oh yeah, and that's dangerous. I don't like So Once again, it's this like concept that. of what? The fatherhood being fluid and then fathers being fungible. And so many guys, brothers think they're doing the right thing. I'm like, no, she's told every guy she's ever met. Hey, I, I'm looking for someone to step up and be a father. You ain't special. She's just trying to run that game on you, see if it works. The same as I've met on some women, you would sleep with them and they say, hey, you're going to pay my rent. Yep. Mm -hmm. I mean, she, hey, she throws it out there and if it sticks, it sticks. So this is something that people need to be cognizant of, right? Uh, so love ashes, that's your perspective. I, I, I would presume that you disagree. Would love for you to tap in and share what you, why you disagree. As you know, you're always welcome on my on my show. Uh, Sister Love Ashes from my hometown, Dayton, Ohio, 937, West Dayton Strong, 937 by way to 619. So Sister Ash, I hope you can tap in. I'm gonna put the link in the chat one more time. We got a lot of comments here in the chat, in the, in the, in the, in the chat. Y'all need to come on and have this conversation. So what about a woman with no kids, kids becoming a stepmother? Um, once again, I'm, I'm just not a fan of step parents at all. I also, I'm a bit leery of someone who doesn't have children being a, a step parent because oftentimes, you know, um, if you are not a parent yourself, you don't really know how to parent, even though we know there's no manuscript or, or textbook on how to become a parent. But there's certain things that you learn 
by what engaging in an action and that action and that behavior on a regular basis. So I think oftentimes when you have someone who comes in as looking to be a step parent, but they aren't a parent themselves, they tend to actually oftentimes not know how to go about engaging in, of course, raising children in a manner that is proper and acceptable. So that's just my perspective. But like I'm someone who's vehemently opposed to this kind of, to being a step parent in any way, shape, or form. So that informs my decision as well. So people with kids should be with people with kids. Um that is that is your take, Sister Ash. I just prefer to be by myself, right? Because <laughs> I'm not going to be with someone else who has children because those children could be Dennis the Menace. Why those children could be being raised in a household that is a criminal incubator. Those children may could have been, God forbid, been victims of physical or sexual abuse. You bring those children into the home with you, and now they're potentially physically or sexually abusing your children or teaching your children unbecoming behavior. So these yeah, are things seen it. that you have to be cognizant of, mm -hmm. right? Socialization is real. We may all be black. We may all understand anti-black racism. We may all understand how white hegemony affects us in all 11 areas of human activity. But socialization, what, takes the key. So something to be cognizant of. Sister Shai says, I don't have kids, but I date a man with one child. Shout out to you. You can share that on the show several times. But let's recenter the conversation. And I need you all to tap in and be part of the conversation. The link is in the chat. And let's really try to deconstruct this concept of the whole husband-son crisis and the rise of the homosexual. As I said before, a homosexual is a gender neutral term. A man and or a woman can be um, a homosexual. And I'm gonna do a show probably Sunday or Monday evening on this concept of um, the social construction of identity, right? I'm working on my dissertation. I was at the library today, putting that work in, right? Put, put, putting some pages together, looking to turn in my chapter two. And so I had to do some reading on this concept of the social construction of identity. So I'm going to do a show on that maybe even tomorrow. But with that being said, let's have this conversation regarding the husband-son crisis and the rise of the homosexual. So the link's in the chat, family. The uh, link is also in the description. And let's just break this down and have, and have this conversation. Again, the homosexual, I think, is stemming from, again, back from the time when housing, when there was a house, you know, the housing issues, mm -hmm. women had a tendency to get the housing as opposed to the men, and men were locked out. And, you know, as you know, with the Claudine story, so that stemmed from all that. Like, for example, as a woman, if let's say I was to go out in the street and I had no place to stay, they're, they're going to give me a place to stay as opposed to a man. They're going to be like, can't you stay in a car or can you bum at some someone's place? Right. So, so men and they also us being black men in, in perspective, you know, being locked out of the the economic system in terms of housing. What how, I'm going to put this: what we as a community, oh, does a brother come in and I'm going to. Brother Lumba, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Go I, I, I didn't want to. Um, I wasn't sure if you want the brother to come through because I, you know, I've talked already. So I'm gonna give somebody the mic too. So, brother Zongo Native, what's the word? Well, uh, this is it's something very new to me. Uh, I haven't I haven't heard of the the term before. Um, um, my my question is like, why why would a man allow? I mean, from uh, looking from the from the man and the the woman dynamic. Why would a man allow um, uh, a woman to have that uh, much authority over him? Do you think is um, um, uh, is going to thrive um, uh, in in the typical family dynamic? If I may ask, Mr. Zong, I'm, and I'm not trying to get too personal with you, or you know, just, just general, just general. You know, I'm not trying. I'm not trying to go anywhere. What how, what dynamics were you raised in? Because I, I live here in, in the DC metro area in the urban environment. And oh oh no, I'm 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 I'm, I'm from Ghana actually, but uh, <laughs> but I'm in Washington state now. I'm working. Oh, out. okay. Oh, yeah. out there in the West Coast. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so okay, that's good. I I got some idea. Yeah. Because I I work in in the community our our urban um black on our urban black environment you see generationally what has happened 
to the black family system dynamics, especially of them systematically locking black men out of the workforce, systematically pushing women to have more resources than men. And therefore that's causing an imbalance. So you have a young man who's always raised, who may be raised with his mother, who's never really seen a man in any type of authority figure. So now he's coming of age. So all he knows is that the woman always makes the decisions. So he has a tendency to lean towards that. And so, there's no men, and there's no like men group or men like in, in, uh, in Africa. Like I was telling you about my colleague who, when she was a baby, she was sent to li go live with the her father's family. Exactly. So I wanted to, that's what I, <laughs> so that's what I wanted to ask um, Lamumba. Do you think um, since like most of like the the Black American family culture was inherited uh, from the greater white society, do you think uh, uh, I mean a few uh, Black American family can go to Africa and probably like take a um, a certain tribe and look at how. So real, real, real quick, so a couple things. The proper term is ethnic group, not tribe. We know okay, tribe okay, 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 take okay. something that is pejorative, something that is primitive, something that is uncivilized. So okay. we want to say ethnic group, and I prefer the term African American as opposed to Black American. Uh, I believe it's best for us to identify based on ethnicity rather than mm -hmm. race, because we know for our, our ancestors who were brought to America. There was a process of dis Africanization and then, of course, racialization to take them from being a free, proud, and productive African to, of course, being a, a someone who was enslaved. Oh, okay. I mean, I mean, it's hard. I mean, I mean, navigating the black conversation, sometimes you do hear them saying black. Oh, I know, I know. I know. <laughs> it's a little confusing to me, actually. But I mean, the, the, the main point of my question is that um, do you think? I mean, the African American family seems like their culture was in, like they inherited their culture from the you know, uh, the, the the greater white society. Do you think it's possible for them to probably like, you know, take a, a a certain ethnic group within the country in Africa so that they can you know they can study uh, the the family dynamic uh, of the society so oh, that. Uh, maybe, they can take well, the, the the good things and implement them within uh, their society. Well, so I'm, I'm gonna push. I'm gonna push back against that, right? Because there has been. Um, I, I teach African American history, right? Mm -hmm. And one of the key thing, core themes of my course is African cultural retention. Right? We know oftentimes there is a narrative amongst lay people uh, that in which they perpetuate this this belief that um, African Americans had their culture completely destroyed. And that's patently false. There is a, a wide swath of literature on African culture retention and African American culture, starting with the book, The Myth of the Negro Past by Dr. Melvin J. Herskovitz, who of course, was, which was the first book written on African cultural retention and African American culture. I believe this book was written back in the 1940s. Actually, when you study the black family dynamic or African American family unit, what we tend to find is there are numerous examples of African cultural retention in the African American uh, family and community, particularly this concept of the what of the extended family, right? Mm -hmm. um, so the what, what we tend to find the breakdown of the black family unit, the African American family unit, doesn't come as a lot of us being poor imitations of whites. Uh, and as we know that even in many uh, uh, Af classical and even contemporary African cultures, that they they had nuclear family units, right? But what we tend to find is it, it was a result of government policy. That broke up and mm -hmm. destabilized the black family yeah. structure, and that that government policy was, of course, the great the Great Society uh, mm -hmm. initiative that was implemented by Linda Baines Johnson in, in the nineteen sixties. Yeah, I, I'm asking this question. I'm not speaking um, from the place of uh, thinking that my culture is better. You know, I do, I do, I do hear that kind of conversation on other channels, but um, um, I, I'm speaking from a more um, more uh, a respectful way that you know because i mean uh no culture is the best you know there are certain aspects of the culture that might be you know uh bad that you want to throw yes, away. Yes, too. yes and I'm glad, I'm glad you brought that up because oftentimes when when we mention our culture we speak so speak of it in a glowing manner and rightfully so we should be at, uh proudly ethnocentric but it oftentimes to the point to where we're unable to be what critical and look at things that are, of course beneficial some things that are of course uh uh, unhealthy, right? And so I, I really appreciate the fact that you were able to mention that, that, un and understanding that culture was fluid, it's not static, 
and that we should always be looking to learn and grow and better ourselves and our culture each and every day. Exactly. I mean, the reason why I said that was, do you know, like, I mean, uh, I mean, I, I, I'm I'm very recent in the United States, right? I, I've been here like three years now. Okay. Um, and, and growing up in Ghana, I know like the systems, like in a, like a patriarchy. Yeah, what, what part of Ghana did you grow up in? If you don't mind me asking. Um, Kofori, do I like close to Accra? Let okay, okay, okay. So you were further south. Okay, got you. Yeah, but I, I grew up in a Muslim family too, as well. Okay, inshallah, inshallah, right? <laughs> My ex brother's uncle. So while you're here, you go, you're not you're not with um you're not with Becky, are you? Oh no, I came to college over here. I graduated, and uh, I'm currently working as a as a permit engineer now. So you're not dating Becky, are you? No, I'm not. <laughs> okay, no, all right, you you good? We good? We good? We good? As long as you're not with Becky. Yeah, but but uh, I mean, you know, it's it's really confusing to me because uh, sometimes you know you do hear in the black conversation they say, "Oh, don't marry a black woman," you know. This, I mean, so I I try to engage myself um, in in this kind of discussions to kind of learn from you know um, the black the black perspective, you know, because coming from Ghana to America, I mean, I always wanted to date black, and uh, also here in America, like even where I work. You don't see a lot of like black people. You, mm -hmm. When you see all the groups, they marry them on their, you know. Um, right, and, 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 and yes, I think that's a great point. We know that I think it's 80, 85% of, of all people, irrespective mm -hmm. of racial, ethnic background, they, they practice what is known as what homogeneous uh, uh, procreation, mm -hmm. right? So they, they procreate with their own. So, the, so but I, what I would argue is that it's not so much that you don't date black, it's that you don't date ratchet. Right, so you just yeah. want to see the person and, you with exactly. Right. You're absolutely right, right? So, I mean, so uh, my question is, is coming from a genuine uh, um, angle. I'm not, I mean, I'm not. I'm not, I'm not speaking from a place, oh, I think my culture is better or something like that. And I, I was saying, like, coming from Ghana, like, the system is, like, patriarchy, you know, and coming to America, uh, I see kind of, like, a different trend that, you know, a lady has, a, a woman has the right, she can tell a man, oh, I don't love you tomorrow, she can just throw everything in the basket, right? Yeah, I, I, yeah and a lot of that came out as a result of the no-fault divorce. So many people would make the argument, and I apologize for cutting you off, um, but uh, we tend to find many people who lean on the right would argue, you know, the Republican Party, conservatives, they're pro-family, but it was actually conservatives who actually implemented the uh, no-fault divorce back in the 80s that allowed people to just wake up one day and say, I don't want to be married anymore. I, I, exactly. So uh, I, that's what I was I was saying, that is it possible that the black people, like the, the, the black, uh, oh, so, I'm sorry, the African-American within America can probably like study maybe I mean not all African cultures or maybe some like just mm -hmm. take a case study go to this uh you know African uh, ethnic group study their culture and see how they can implement. So I, I, I would I would say this and um respectfully I don't think that's necessary. Not, if, if, a not, I, I, have, if, the, if a person wants to have if if a person wants to have a healthy family unit they don't have to travel to Africa they just engage in behaviors that make that a, a reality and if they don't they won't. Yeah, I, I'm. I, I wasn't done with my statement. I was saying, in a way that, in, in case there's a problem, like there's a conflict within the family, they wouldn't resort to the American system to kind of like you know mm -hmm. destroy exactly. the whole family. Oh, is, is there a way that you can create a um, exactly a, a system within the American system? That's what that we need. If there's a problem, there's sort of like a mediation that goes within the own cultural uh, system without having to go to like the court system. That should be like the final result. Because you do see uh, sometimes uh, the, the Muslims do practice a system like that. They have the, the, their, their system within um, um, the greater society. And if there's a problem within the family, they can resort to that uh, system. And that makes complete sense. But in order for that to happen, and I, I'm going to make this argument, one doesn't need to travel to Africa. One just has to, one, have those values and then set up that type of system or initiative here in, of course, society and in, in our own community. Right. So we know even in Jewish communities, a woman mm -hmm. can't get a divorce unless she goes to the synagogue, speaks mm -hmm. with the rabbi and then has to request that the husband will and then ask the husband if he will grant her a divorce. And if she leaves the marriage without being granted a divorce, she becomes a social leper and no one would associate with her. However, in the black community of a woman uh, leaves her family, she got 12 suitors, a dozen suitors the next day. Exactly. You so, see. like I said, it, it, it's it's in terms of the what community values, right? I think I I don't know who the rapper is, 
But when Kobe Bryant passed away, um, mm -hmm. he, he and his daughter, and of course the other people who were the victims of that tragic helicopter crash, uh, there was some rapper out on social media talking about, hey, I'm trying to get with his 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 now um, ex-wife. Well, you know, his 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 um um what's it called when you 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 have Widow. a in the past? Widow. 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 So I mean, so these are the type of type of things that we're looking at. But I would argue that because we we um are in America. And we are under a, like a system like Islam, which of course in Islam you had the Ummah, which is the, Islam, the Muslim community, right? Mm -hmm. uh, or even like in Judaism, individuals are able to vacillate back and forth between the American system and what? This concept of being African-centered. Mm -hmm. right? So I could be African-centered when it benefits me and I'm going to run to the American system when it benefits me. Now I'm speaking from experience because my ex-wife was that way. Okay. I mean, yeah, so it was, yeah, 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 yeah. I disagree with her. I'm running to the okay, court. I'm coming to the white right, man. Right, so, so. Yeah. Uh, could I add something to Brother Zongo's um, point? I had a sister who um, was caught up in the life and converted to um, Islam. What life are you, what life are you, are you speaking of? So speak okay. Of. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, uh, you know, Sex, rock and roll, and drugs. I'll say okay. that. <laughs> and she converted to Islam. And by that, when she converted, there was a, a safety net community. Uh, they, they helped her. She she got married. She was able to get her own place. You know, minus the system at large. And per mind, I've I lost touch with her since the pandemic she's moved forward in a positive way so that's why i admired at least the muslim community for that because they've taken a lot of people in the black community who've had ish you know concerns in the society at large but once they decide to convert to, to islam and take on you know islamic practices you know they're able to succeed so i just hope you know you continue to sustain um your culture because it's good yeah, I mean, so, so Lumumba uh, uh, recognizing the problem or the challenges facing the black community how then do I mean I, I, don't, I, I don't intend to put myself into the black community I mean the African American community but then how then do they reverse the, 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 the problem from continuing for a very long time it's, there has to be something done about it right <laughs> Yeah, some people you just have to cut off. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and disassociate yourself with. And, I, and this is true stories. I'm gonna give you an example. When my son was in first grade, he his best friend was some boy who was always getting into trouble. My son was running right along with him. This is back when my son was super small. He's six two now, right? Wish he could go back to being that little, right? <laughs> um, and I told him, I said, you are to disassociate yourself with him. You are to never speak to him again. He is bad for your life. But if 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 he or she's with no, 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 let me let me finish. Um, we fast forward eight nine years. That young man is in prison for armed robbery. Whoa! How old is he? Uh, about 15, 16. But see, I knew this because I saw that the household the boy was growing up in was a criminal incubator. Wow. Yeah, I saw that when my son was in first grade. I saw. Yeah, we're gonna end this right now. We're going to end this right now. So there are certain people you just have to cut off and have nothing to do with. Because there's a difference, there's a difference between being Black, being African American, and being a Negro. <laughs> okay? There's a difference. Can, can you explain that? <laughs> Absolutely. And I'm so glad that you asked, right? So we see, uh, of course, from the frame of reference that I'm using, a Black critical theory perspective, of uh, someone who was a Negro or someone who was engaging in racially disempowering, self-defeating, and self-destructive behavior, right? We see someone who was Black as someone who was reaffirming their link to their, Af to their African history, heritage, and culture, and as someone who was African-American, who was someone who was, what, working or in the, actually living and viewing the world from a Pan-Africanist ethos in which they understand the global ubiquitous nature of anti-Blackness and understand that in order to combat white hegemony, which is global in nature, we must what we must fight it in, 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 in a global capacity as well. Oh, okay. 
That makes sense. Uh, I know I do. That's why I said it. <laughs> and, 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 brother, and Brother Zongo, are you aware of the possibilities of why the Black population of the West Coast has declined? Because at one point, it was pretty pretty comparative. I mean, I have no knowledge of that, but I do know for a fact that when I came over here, I don't see a lot of black people over here. Yeah, you got to say, uh, in the West Coast, the black population was pretty, you know, growing from, I think, the 1940s to about the 1980s. When you say West Coast, where, where exactly do you mean? Do you West Coast, you're, West, you're Washington State, right? Like No, Washington. I mean, like, do you mean like California, Oregon, or do you include Washington State as part of it? Yeah, well? Washington State is considered West Coast. I mean, because I heard about the the Great Migration. I mean, uh, yes, they came. They came to that. Uh, yeah, and I think some of these states even had uh, ordinance against black people. Could you give some examples? Um, Oregon, for I know, for example, had a had ordinance on um, not black people. Um, yeah, because they did not want. Basically, you know, I'm, I'm sorry, um, in this case, my memory, I'm, and I'm not versed on that history, but per my understanding, they put they created a lot of ordinances to prevent the black population from the West Coast uh, to increase. So, when did this take place? Um, Oregon, I know for a fact it was placed in Oregon. No, I said when back in the 1940s. Okay, was, hold on, let me see if I can find something. Now you're gonna make me. And and so, and then hold on, Oregon. Let me see, Washington State. Peace, family. If you're watching, make sure you hit the subscribe and like button. Thumbs up, thumbs up, thumbs up. Hit that notification bell as well. Sister Ash, I see you got some comments in the um, in the uh, you got some comments you made. I'd love for you to tap in and be part of the conversation. Sister Carrie says, that's good. You cut that off, Brother Lumumba, early. Absolutely. And, and so here's part of the thing. When you are in a position, a leadership position, being a parent, there are times that you have to make command decisions, right? Right, wrong, and different. As I said before at the beginning of the broadcast, we tend to find ourselves in our community in a position where we don't want to say what needs to be said, and we're un, unwilling oftentimes to make decisions um, or that, that many people believe would hurt people's feelings, right? But I knew. I'm looking out for the welfare of my son. I saw the young man was being raised in a criminal incubator. I can recall in the, in the movie Belly Now stated, you know, the young man in the movie that he, of course, had developed uh, a relationship with, he said there was no hope for the future, right? And so he saw at an early age that the young man was going to go down a life, of, live his life in a life of crime. So it's something we have to be cognizant of. And so, and be, and be unafraid to tell our children, you can't associate that with that person. Now, we know uh, when your kids get a certain age, they're going to say, you're trying to ruin my life, you're trying to control me. And we even know that from a feminist perspective, they would argue that it's extremely problematic, that it's representative of patriarchy, so on and so forth. But you really, in my opinion, have to, you know, really uh, just cut that nonsense out. Don't even pay attention to it and do what you know is best. And, and thank you for doing that for your son, because it is hard because I do see it where you have, you know, you, I, and I've seen it with some of my clients where they grow up with a certain person and it breaks my heart. So, um, well, I do have a question uh, that I've heard a lot um, uh, from from the from the migrant community over here. Uh, I mean, I mean, even when I was in Missouri, I was told the same thing. When I came here too, I met a couple of guys who told me the same thing that, hey, I know maybe you are you, like you like black people, but don't marry a black lady. Why do you think they always say that to me? Well, I think I think there's a couple of reasons, right? Um, mm -hmm. So one, we know that black women in America have the lowest um, marriage rate. I think it's one out of four. So 25% mm -hmm. very, very uh, are, are likely to get married. I think what we have found, particularly in um, latter generations or contemporary generations of black women, is an impetus and an embrace of engaging in rather cantankerous, bellicose, and truculent behavior. And as that, have, that being a representation of what black womanhood is. And as a result, most men, irrespective of their racial or ethnic background, aren't willing to want to associate with, for a, a, a long period of time, uh, someone who engages, or it is a belief that the person engages in that type of behavior. So they do have a valid point when they make such arguments, right? 
Yeah, I mean, uh, for example, there are some black women I wouldn't touch with a 10-foot pole. I wouldn't go near them with a 10-foot pole. But there's some black women that do want to, who do want a relationship, who do want genuine and who are humble enough to have a relationship. But I also know there's <laughs> I work with them. <laughs> brother, 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 brother design, I like the point you made, brother. You said that ain't stopping migrants from sleeping with them, though. And I would agree, right? So we know Kevin Samuels would always state that there's a difference between a man pursuing you because he wants sex and a man pursuing a woman because he wants marriage. And so, as we all know, as men, we have some biological needs that every now and then we want to have met. And so, as a result, you, you pursue someone with, with the, of uh, course, goal of having, uh, you know, uh, conjugal relations with that person. But that doesn't mean that you want to actually marry that person or be in a long-term relationship with them. So that's something to be cognizant of as well. Yeah, I had a guy who, I worked with a family, a guy who had a, this woman, um, she was with a Nigerian guy. Um, I think, you know, he was a young guy, you know, college student, whatever the case may be. And I think because he was getting older, now he was trying to gear towards more of his culture. <laughs> if you know what I, you know. Especially, you know, when you go out to the community, go out to functions. And she, you know, she's, you know, very, you know, independent. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and I think, I think if, we're, if we're honest, um, the, majority, the majority of Black culture is dysfunctional. <laughs> I mean, we, just, we just have to be real about this, right? So that plays a role as well. And we know who is the primary purveyor of culture to the child, the mother. Right, so that would play a role, a role as well, right? I saw uh, a, a clip on YouTube where a woman had her toddler son, the boy's about maybe a year and a half, 18 to 20 months, and she had him doing photo shoots with a bunch of tattoos. Oh, gosh. Right, so like I said, if you come across that, common sense would say, I'm not going to associate with someone like that, right? So Sister Carrie says, growing up, my parents didn't allow me to sleep at anyone's house. The first sleepover I, I went Two was when I was 17. Yeah, I had the same situation myself. Um, that's not where I was like, I, like camping or something like that. Um, so Sister Shy says she had the same thing for her. Sister Carrie, I have to say some of it is based off of anti-blackness, self-hate, colorism, futurism, and texturism as well. I would agree wholeheartedly with that as well. We do know that, that we have individuals in our community on both sides of the Atlantic Ocean who uh, have suffered from colorism issues, don't want to be with someone who has coarse hair, dark skin, so on and so forth. So I appreciate you bringing that up as well, Sister Carrie. Thank you very much. As a matter of fact, you need to tap in, be part of this conversation when we're talking about the husband-son crisis, all right? Oh, yeah, I sent you some information in the comment section, brother. Yes, I saw that. On the West Coast. Um... Yes. Yes, I saw that. Um, so, why, yeah, uh, why, why don't you... Go right, you... right here, brother. Why don't you include the man as part of the responsibility, though? Why don't you hold him? What? Why don't you hold him accountable too? But we can't. Wait, 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 hold on. But go, brother native, go right ahead. Why don't you hold the man accountable for being complicit in causing this dysfunction in the community as well? Well, So this this is what I'm going to say, Um, and I think there are times where men are accomplices, right? When they choose and deal with and engage with women who behave and act in this manner. But the reason why I push back a little bit against that is because we know charity starts at home, as Marcus Garvey taught us, right? And so a lot of this dysfunction begins in the household. And I was on a I was on a podcast maybe two or three days ago, and a brother was like, "Well, see, brothers, you just got to be in a home. You just got to be in a home." And I said, "Hold on, now, you can't force someone to be in a relationship with you, right?" And I, I'm speaking from the experience. I was married, had a child, and I came home from work one day, and a woman said, "Hey, I don't want to be married no more. He ain't even your son." So, right, so then, of course, my son grew up in an environment in which he wasn't being held accountable, and there was nothing I could do about it because I wasn't in the home. So th- we have to understand that the family court system plays a role in, of course, allowing women to have the power to get the man's resources but remove him from what? The everyday job and task of actually raising, socializing, and educating that child into a productive adult. This is something that actually happens. And now that my son is 15, my, my ex-wife has been calling me when well, she called me maybe two months ago, begging me somehow, hey, he's 6'2", 170 pounds. I can't, I, I can't do nothing with him. Can, can I give him to you? 
right? So these type of things happen. And part of it, the reason why is because oftentimes, and this is just my personal opinion, even though this is based, this is substantiated by scholarship, scholarly literature, the family court support system supports women in these things. For example, I've seen cases where this actually happened in my hometown. This is probably about 10 years ago. There was a brother who he came home from work. His two daughters, one was 14, the other was 12, were dancing. They were twerking on Facebook Live in their skivvies, in the bra and panties. He comes in, gives them a whooping, right? The mother calls the police on him and has him arrested. Mm. I mean, although, like, the court system support the women, but the, the women also do share... Um, but not, not, not just the... Uh, you said the court system, yes. Okay. Yeah, the, the, court, the court system is the enemy of us. It's it's the court system. So if we were if we could have our communities like it was before, a lot of this nonsense would have been gone. But because of the systematic attacks on it, that's why. We well, have I mean, but see, but here's the thing: the court system can dictate to you what takes place exactly. unless you go to the court system. Exactly. But, right. So the thing is, and we got to be honest: most women, the first thing any. Hey, anytime you disagree with me, we're going to run to the courts because I know 95% of the time they're going to take my side. Mm -hmm. Like I said, that father gave his daughters a whooping. Now, many people go, oh, you maybe shouldn't use corporal punishment, yada, yada, yada. But he disciplined his children, corrected his children for engaging in what? And uh, in, in, in what? Signifying sexually lascivious behavior. And the mother called the police on him. Mm -hmm. This is why I say, no, nah, you can't really put it on the guy unless he's going. He's in the home and going along with it. Because oftentimes, if the man won't go along with the behavior, he's <laughs> going to be ridiculed. He's going to be excoriated as being patriarchal, controlling, abusive, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and removed from the situation. This mm. is a reality. Can, can I can I say something, please? Please. Then the I respect your discipline in your personal life as you talk about certain subjects. If there was, like even Kevin Samuels, I had a lot of respect for Kevin Samuels and I'm, I'm sad that he passed away because he brought a lot of things home, whether we liked it or not. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and and the feminism likes to sell us a dream. Yeah. <laughs> we have to look at what? Real world application. How does this apply? And, and so this is the thing I even, because like I said, I work in higher ed. I tell a lot of my contemporaries, this is just theoretical. You can actually apply. Show me where you've where this has been applied in an everyday life in the real world, and it's actually worked. So, uh, Lumumba, like, cause I was saying, like, I uh, I grew up from Ghana, right? So I grew up in a Muslim family, <laughs> and Ghana is not a, a predominantly Muslim society, right? But right. we do have our system within the Ghanaian society too, as well. Or like our marriage system, when we get married, we don't we don't go to like the Ghanaian court to get married. Like we do get married within our own like Muslim court. Mm -hmm. when we when we divorce, we divorce through our own Muslim court. Mm -hmm. Right. And um if you we have a Sharia law basically. And you have a mis exactly and if you have a misunderstanding with your wife, I mean the, the wife just resorts to her parents and you resort to your parents, they right. don't call the police on you. Right, so we, like, right. Here exactly. they just call the police and come get his ass. Exactly. Right. So we come into America and then hearing the police to me, like, it's something completely different to me because mm -hmm. we have a system within a system in Ghana that operate right. for us. So that's why I was saying, like, do you think black community can also, like, do something similar to, you know... Well, so like, I, I would stuff? say this. I, I'm aware of some married couples that when they had problems, that's what they did. They brought both of their parents together and sat down and had a conversation. But the yeah. reality is, and this is just my personal opinion, and many people would argue it's because I'm jaded, but what I've seen, even when I was a part of working with the Montgomery County Fatherhood Initiative, is that most women don't want to do that. They're going to go the police and court route because they know that that would give them the upper hand. Mm. So real quick, Brother Design says, white man patriarchal system incentivizes its behavior, mm -hmm. i.e. product of the environment. I, I really don't know what you mean by that, Brother Design. So if you could please tap in and be part of the conversation so we can unpack that comment, I'm going to put the link in the chat right below mm -hmm. your comment. And mm -hmm. I really would hope that you could tap in and share what you mean by the white man patriarchal system incentivizes this behavior, i.e. a product of environment. All also, right, go, go right ahead. And also, can I say something, please? You, um, Brother Native, you're from Ghana, right? In Ghana, for, my, in Ghana uh, for the most part, 
the Akans, uh, I believe they uh, they inherited the mother. Am I yeah. correct, sir? Yes. Yeah. Okay. I mean, they they yeah they they inherited the true matrilineal side. Matrilineal. Okay, uh, better term. Thank you. If we were to implement that, see, but what happened is there's still a check and balance system within that system. You even though it's matrilineal, you don't still see you still don't see the women calling the police on the men. You still have to go through the various protocols when there's a situation right. in the household. And the reason for that is though is it's, and many people are trying to make this argument that black men have adopted a patriarchy and they love no. it for white men. But the reality is, African societies. Mm -hmm. The majority of African societies were patriarchal prior to Europeans coming there. And in fact, that's one of the things that the colonizers say that they were surprised they had in common with Africans, was that the society was patriarchal. And here's the thing, not like 98% of all cultures and civilizations in the world are and have been patriarchal. Exactly, yeah. yeah. So this isn't something that, oh, we learned from white people. This is the way the societies have run, ran, civilizations have been ran since antiquity. But I also feel as black, some a lot of the black women I have, they have some underlying issues. They some of them are just vengeful. They just they're ready to go after. They're looking for something. They want to fight mm -hmm. the girl down the street. They want to. They're just looking for something. They're looking yeah. for something. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like so the, I, the girl with the, the Nigerian guy I was telling you about, because he was decided that you know he was trying to get back to his roots. She was saying that he was changing. She messed him over because she, she saw that. And I'm like, dude, you should have just left. <laughs> but that's I another mean, discussion. <laughs> yeah. Lamar, yeah. And, I, I, what do you think the level of what kind of like like the 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 black uh, the African Americans like what kind of like education do the, like do the Americans they the general, they to the public hold, hold on, hold on, hold on, Sister Michelle. Let but the native speak. I'm sorry. Yeah, what, what like what kind of education like does the american like educational system provide to them cuz i mean i mean having come over here i work as an engineer i work with white people they don't you know and i was oh, I, i've been always anxious to meet like black people when i came over here so so one time i went to tacoma to visit like a, a black community you know, and I was communicating with some brother over there. He didn't know like well, who I was, and he asked me like where I came from. I told him, "Oh, I'm from I'm from Ghana," and so immediately he asked me, "Oh, do um, do 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 I do I play with lions over there?" So, and I I kind of find it very like I was surprised actually. I wasn't I didn't see that very disrespectful, but I was surprised that you live in America and you're still asking this kind of questions. Um, well, yeah. so there's the, a couple of things. Real the quick. fellow like white counterparts that was born and raised over here in this country, they don't think that way. So why, right, so, so very why is the black um, thinking that way? Dr. Carter G. Woodson, he's considered the father, of course, of black of the black of black history. He wrote a book entitled The Miseducation of the Negro. And what he argues in the book is that black people are taught an education that teaches them to pedestalize everyone else's history, heritage, and culture, but what demonize and reject and repudiate our, our own. Mm -hmm. The second issue is that um well, in America, we're socialized to view Africa in a negative light. Michael X talked about this in his famous speech, uh, you can't hate the roots of a tree without hating the tree itself. And he talks about how we were taught uh, rather um, uh, implicitly and explicitly that Africa was a place of savages, cannibals, lions, tigers, bears, oh my, and that in internalizing those views of Africa, we end up hating ourselves. And so I'm, I'm going to show you a great, this is a great book. It's entitled Mistaking Africa, uh, Curiosities and Inventions of the American My Mind. And it show, it, it, this book goes into detail about the numerous misrepresentations and stereotypical ca caricatures of African life, culture, and people in regular, everyday American media. So oftentimes that comes as a result of, the, of Black people internalizing those concepts, ideas that they see, of course, in everyday American media. Also coupled with, with ignorance, intellect, and lack, and in, being intellectually lazy and not willing to pick up a book and read. Oh, okay, yeah. Because I, I find it very. I was in shock. I didn't find it very disrespectful. I was just surprised that mm -hmm. why this American would think that way. Yeah, why I mean, American for, doesn't think that way. I was yeah, like, for, yeah. Why, why? For, for example, um, I, I had dated a sister from South Sudan once. She was a model and shit. Oh my god, right. Mm. Um. But I remember uh, she had a little sister who was in high school when we were dating. And so she, her little sister came home and was like, 
I don't understand. Why don't African Americans think they're African? They could look in the mirror and see that they're African, but they think that they're American. And I say this because of the educational process has taught them that. The education that they received has taught them that they are American, not African, even though they've never been treated like an American their entire life. Right? So once again, we see the powerful role that education plays. And this is why Malcolm X stated that only a fool will allow their enemies to educate their children. Exactly right. So yeah, yeah, yeah. You're absolutely right. Then there's there, there, there's, a, there's a huge challenge within the community, and something needs to be done imperatively. Mm-hmm. To, to, to solve it. Yeah. So what again? Can I add something to, the the link is in the chat, right? The link is in the chat. Um, tap in, but a design. I still need you to tap in so you can unpack that comment that you made. Uh, we're talking about the husband son crisis and the rise of the hobo sexual so brother um zongo nader have you ever seen a husband son type relationship to where the, the 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 brother was in a relationship in which he 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 acted as if he was the son in the household in a western society yes sir um that would be extremely hard i haven't seen that before That's why. Okay. yeah i haven't seen that before i mean uh, I stayed in Missouri, and uh, you know, uh, it's like a why. Uh, how do I say? Like it's a. It's, they told me it's a, like a it's a it's a it's a church. They are predominantly like Christians over there. They have like you know, um, a traditional family household. You don't see stuff like that over there. Um, even when I came to Washington, most of like the colleagues, they they have like a two family household, and everybody kind of contributes in their household. I haven't seen that. I don't know. Um, I'm, I'm I'm eager to know more about that. I haven't seen that before. <laughs> but I did see that. I did. I did. I think I did see. I didn't see something like that. But what I did see was when I was in Illinois. I did like a sister from from um, Illinois. And when I visited her family, I noticed that her grandma, her, her, her grandma, her mom, there was no like male figure in the house. There was, there was no such thing like that in the house. And I, her grandma, uh, there was no husband over there. Her mom, there was no husband over there. Yeah, it, it was just hard for me to kind of process that too. Yeah, I think that was that was my experience over here, yeah. Got you. So very quickly, uh, Brother Design says he blames the sister, not the sisters. Sister Shy claps back in a rather loving manner, right? And says sometimes you have to blame the sisters. Sister Shy states that um, they need to be held accountable. I've seen how they act. They need to change their funky attitude. Uh, so this is something, unfortunately, that tends to be uh, pervasive in our community. We all know that. Can I, say, that, my, my, that, I say my theory? Why, Doctor, uh, Mr. Lalumba, please? Please. I think what has happened as 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 black women, and because we lost our ethnic um, identity through this Western system, we lost that inkling through survive in terms of surviving. Not we 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 were reduced to a survival, just trying to get something to eat, just trying to keep clothes on our back, trying to see keep roof over our head. Where when you look into the uh, African system. You're looking at your legacy. You're looking at your ancestors. You're looking at the future. So therefore, as a woman, one of the things you look forward to as you are securing uh, your legacy is to be married, is to have that self-respect, community respect. So therefore, you're going to humble yourself for marriage. You're going to humble yourself to raise your sons. You're going to humble yourself so the, so your spouse or the men of your community can take the lead so you can take care of your role in terms of nurturing the next generation. So we as a community, as an ethnic group can survive. We lost that. We, we That has been lost. And I think that's the, to me, that's the missing key. And I think that would help a, a lot of us women stop going to the court system and see what the court system really is and really, and really deal with our men from a community basis. And, and understand, um, and then then the psych, then we got to talk about the psychosocial issues we ha- we had, the sexual issues, the sexual abuse, um, 
all that comes into play. And we really need to come back to our full center as a people to understand why we need to, you know, we need to be together because that's how we've always survived and our wealth is in our ability to survive and our connectiveness. So, but, but the question I do have for you that, uh, Bert Lamuba says you don't have to go and stay in a different mall in a different country, right? And then con con the fact that the system has already been destroyed, what model do you think the current generation have for them to look up to? Because there's no model out there for them to look up to. I agree with you. I agree with you on that point in terms of like the Native Americans. They have their own, they have constitutional rights in terms of, and therefore their family system, if there's a concern in their family or community system. We as black people also in turn need specific laws and um, ordinances for our challenges because it's so pervasive. But again, because we, I think because we've lost that inkling of survival in terms of generationally, we're just trying to survive for the day. It's about me, 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 me. Uh, blank everyone else. And because we lost that key, now you're seeing the, this dysfunction manifesting itself. Because during slavery, we were still trying to keep it together. Even after slavery, we were still trying to keep, keep it together. Once we believe we got some opportunity, everything went loose. And even brother, I had a sister they brought from a Western African country husband um because the kids came into our, our our on our radar because the mother started to get make a little bit of money as a nurse and she started to kick the husband to the curb husband brought her filed for her did everything for her put her in a nice home everything once she got to a point where she felt independent she tried to kick him to the curb hmm. oh wow and i'm sure brother native you've heard of such stories Oh, I've heard a lot of things, you know. Okay. <laughs> so, so it's telling me something has happened to us here and something's happened to us on the continent and the Caribbean where we as women, as soon as we get a little bit, we're ready to kick the man to the curve. So something deeper is going on here. Yeah, but we cannot always blame the system, right? I, 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 didn't say, I think it's a part. Of, I think it's a part of the problem. I'm not saying it's the whole problem. It's part of the problem. But I do feel as though we as a people have lost that inkling for survival. Because if you understand what we need to survive, you understand we need to stay together and stick together. Yes, it's going to be hard. Yes, we're going to have our bad days. Yes, we're not going to, you know, wake up with googly eyes with each other. But we got, we know that we got to stick it together. So listen, so listen, family, this is what we need to do. I need Sister Shy and Sister Love Ash to be part of the conversation, to tap in, come on here, and have this conversation on the live, not just in the chat. So please do that. Brother John, I see you in, in the queue. You're not a member of the community, so you can't be part of the conversation. Okay. Go, so Sister Shy, Sister, Sister Love Ash, I need you all to tap in and let's have this conversation on the live rather than just in the chat. And as you all know, you do not have to come up to be part of the conversation. Go right ahead. Oh, uh, thank you for Black America Television News info Information. And, and, and real quick, Sister Ash says, I think well, a lot of times uh, anxiety builds up. That's where the attitude can stem from, anxiety and other issues. Look, a lot of... So I'm going to push back. I, like I said, I did a show on ratchet feminism. A lot of this attitude comes from the fact, I see you, Sister Trina, so you can turn your camera off. Uh, a lot of this comes from the fact that this is something that is marketable. For example, when I did my show on ratchet feminism, and many, many people thought I was capping when I did a show on this term, there was a sister who did her master's thesis on ratchet feminism. Ratchet feminism in, is, is an is a ideology that embraces Black women being cantankerous, bellicose, truculent, hard to deal with, and argues that behaving this way is empowering. So this isn't a situation where, oh, people are going through stuff, they have a lot to deal with. No, people are embracing this behavior because they think it's empowering to do so. Because, the, I mean, can I say, push, can I say something? It's the system that's in, that makes them believe it's empowering to do so. Look at Lizzo. 
Look, I'm overweight too. Well, I'm hold on, hold on, too. hold on. So, so this is what I'm going to oh, say. I'm sorry, I don't want to take the, the floor from Miss Jackson. Yeah, no, it's, it's all good, but, but I can't blame the system because people have free will. People have these are grown adults making decisions to engage in said behavior. So exactly. I'm not going to blame the system. I, maybe exactly. I can say that if you're 16 and you you know your pre your your frontal prefrontal cortex hasn't fully developed and you're easily manipulated. I'm not going to say that about someone who's 32 years old. Because some of them who never grew up, who are 13 years old, who never grew well, up. But once again, whose fault is that? That's not the system's fault. That's the person in their family. If I if I decided to become a miscreant, which one time in my life I was a miscreant, that is that wasn't the system's fault. That was me not following the instruction and example my parents set for me. Where's the self-determination? Where's the agency? Why do we have this overabundance of victimhood? Because it's just promoted by society. And that's why I have a job in the human service field, because we, it pays. All right. But Sister Ash and Sister Shy, I need y'all to tap in and be part of this conversation. Sister Jackson, what say you? Well, in, uh, in respect to Michelle N's comment, I think a lot of it has to do with today, as women, and particularly Black women, we, a lot of us today are into the feminist movement, and what is happening is you see a lot of Black women going to school, getting education now, and getting job, get these so-called good jobs, or they're starting their businesses. So I think what's happening is Black women have been are thinking that if they get a little bit of money or you know doing their thing they don't need a man or i don't need him no more because he doesn't make as much money as me so when they start some of these sisters not all but some of these sisters that get to a certain income uh bracket they they got this empowered feeling well why why do i need him so i'm kicking him to the curb and I'm going to go on and make this money and go about my business or find a man that makes the same amount of money or more money as me. So I think that's what's happening. And I agree with you, Ms. Jackson, but then when you see those, those same sisters that are pursuing a career over finding a compatible mate, by the time they're ready to find a compatible mate, it may be too late. That that is true. It may be too late, but I don't know. Some of these sisters just feel that I, I make all this money, and they feel they don't need a man. Some of these sisters, so I could just I'm I'd rather be by myself. I've heard, as a matter of fact, I heard a story like this similar once. Um, this guy told me that he was married at one time and his his wife well his ex-wife but they were married at the time he she had moved up got her education moved up and moved on and divorced him because she felt she didn't need him and you know she makes more money than him and she got the big head and she divorced him and that's really sad because there's more to life than the money you know He's he's a good companion. Yeah, we're getting caught up in dollars and cents, and we're not looking at a bigger picture. Um, like I said with the story earlier, you had this lady in the mid forties who di literally died alone because she put her career before you know anything else. And look what has happened. I think in the black community today, we're living in a time where a lot of we're not growing up with parents teaching us the value of marriage anymore they're not teaching us marriage i think a problem is that a lot of the black families today are teaching their daughters to go to school be independent don't depend on no man and get this money and then we live in a society where media is it's all this is media generated where mm -hmm. you, you you notice on tv you see you see a lot of this especially these tv shows where it's a like let's say it's a black TV show where the the wife, the black wife is educated and she works in corporate America, but the husband is blue collar. You see a lot of that kind of dynamic on TV. 
So they're promoting this. Well, the women can be educated, but the men are not. It's a lot of that. I'm, I'm just saying it's a lot of that going on. We're not promoting family anymore in the black community, in my opinion. And it's to our detriment, Ms. Jackson. It's to our detriment. Yep. And and uh, I I absolutely agree with you too because uh, I do know like in, in the African society where I grew up, like, marriage is promoted. Um, mm -hmm. If you come home as a lady, a young lady with a child, um, I mean the future is very bleak for you as far as marriage is concerned. Um, nobody's going to marry you. Uh, if you have a kid out of wedlock in a Muslim community, you don't own any inheritance. You don't have no will. So it's something which is practiced quite like extensively in Muslim Muslim communities in Africa too as well. So it's a little it's a little different. Oh, uh, hello. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, um, uh, Brother Zongo. I'm sorry. No, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, uh. Um, I was going to say I agree with um, Sister Trina um, about uh, Black people. We, I mean, some of us, we just don't care about marriage anymore. Because even my grandma, my, I mean, my grandma, she's, well, she's a widow now, but she's been married. And she would say to me and, like, my sisters, like, and I'm really surprised my grandma is saying stuff like that. She said, I wouldn't have a man at all if I was y'all. And I, she said, the men are not like the men um, during her generation and things like that. And I always tell my grandma, like, well, I'll, I'll at least one, like, I want to be married. I want to at least have one kid. And her and my mom, they would both be like, you know, you shouldn't have any kids at all. You know, and I, I kind of see why my mom say it. But my for my grandma to be saying that, that's. I don't know. I think that's I, I, that's crazy. But uh, yeah, I could see I could see why women are not getting married because I mean, of what these conversations in our families are like. You know, like it's just terrible. And some of the women in my family, it's just you know. And that's why I said what I said. How some of us we have attitudes and stuff like that. Don't want to be with a man. Um, it you know don't want to have kids and stuff like that and it's just terrible it's it's just terrible and but that's why i'm trying to you know i just think differently i i think marriage wow. is great and i think having kids is great but yeah i understand what you're saying sister wow. trina it's crazy out here so that's Might all i had to say thank you miss miss shy i didn't mean to interrupt you sorry uh thank you for sharing your experience but i also feel it it feeds into the narrative are slowly bringing in the LGBT uh, themes. Uh, because again, black people, the African American people, we've had a rough time in the past hundred, you know, hundred or so years. And we're still recovering from it. Yes, we've improved our condition, but we had to fight for it. However, we've never been debriefed, we've never been giving the community interventions and counseling we need to move forward so we can continue ourselves. And there's effort to depopulate us. There's efforts to keep us disorganized so we are not a threat in, in this country. And unfortunately, a lot of our people have, have been put the bait. And now we're destroying ourselves from within. And this homosexual discussion is an example because men historically always were the warriors in terms of they will fight because if we were really to address this housing issue, this would be a, an internal conflict in the United States right now because we as Black people need access to land. Our land has been stolen. And because our warrior class is so disenfranchised, we're not fighting for it. And we as women are buying this click and bait within the family system, we're taking the court, not thinking the, the system, we've been, we're running game on ourselves. No. And when the man is in the household, he's going to fight for his family. He's going to be like, hey, I'm not making enough. I got three kids to feed. Oh, man, you don't. You got three kids to feed? You're not getting paid enough money? Then you're going to unionize. You're going to unionize for better pay. You're going to say, hey, we can't get decent housing. Hey, man, they're going to they're gonna go to the government. Hey, we need a place to live, too. Matter of fact, you stole my grandfather's land 60 years ago. Matter of fact, I need that back because I need a place for my grandkids. Because they've taken our warrior class out, 
and we as women has helped this, where are we now? Also, don't also let's remember. I'm gonna go back to slavery too. Remember, slavery stole our family values and our culture. We got stripped of it. Okay. So after slavery, what did we do? We became more Americanized. Now, granted, there were more men in the house, it said, during segregated times, but then integration came. That's when, you know. So, our sister, I, I'm, I'm going to have to stop you there because the claim okay. you made is patently false, right? Okay. One, slavery did not destroy um, the Black family. We, we found, as a matter of fact, I actually have a book here, if I can find it very quickly. Uh, no, I'm not. Oh, here we go. By William Stuff Stokely. I actually met him. It's entitled Hattiesburg, an American City in Black and White. He actually um, got his PhD in African American History at the Ohio State University. In this book, he talks about how, if I even have the section highlighted, let me see if I can look very quickly, where he talks about how um, Black people created families uh, right out of and the Holocaust of enslavement because they believe that this was how they could um, create, yes, the nature of Jim Crow uh, knit African-Americans into tight, self-reliant groups that struggled together in their churches, businesses, and schools to insulate themselves from the horrors of racial oppression and to provide better futures for their children. Um, so this concept and idea of destroy the Black family actually isn't true. We found that Black people married at an 80 and sometimes 90% rate in many Black cities, particularly in the South, after the Holocaust of enslavement. The second issue, and I spoke about this before you came on, was that uh, the Holocaust of enslavement did not destroy our culture. In fact, there was an entire um, segment of literature in Black studies on African cultural attention. I have about half a dozen books on African cultural attention and African American culture right behind me, particularly and most notably, The Myth of the Negro Past. I have another book here entitled Exchanging Our Country Marks, The Transformation of African Identities in the Colonial Antebellum South. Uh, so there are numerous uh, scholarly texts on African culture attention in African American culture. So this concept and idea of it destroying our culture is a bit of a misnomer that oftentimes is propagated by lay people. Um, Brother Lumumba, can you please um, put those two books um, like in the comment? I, yes, I just wanna screenshot it so I'll get them, please. Yes ma'am. Thank you. But I also, let me say this, um, like Michelle N said, I think there is a conspiracy to destroy the black family, in my opinion, because look at the media, look at these commercials. They got a black woman with a white man, yeah. <laughs> you know, and then now they have some brothers with other races of women, too. And these commercials, you know, they and then they got the LGBTQ movement and things like that. I think what it is. <clears throat> I came up with my a theory about this. I could be wrong. This is one reason why I say they're trying to destroy the black family is because if you get a strong black man and a strong black woman, they produce strong, healthy black children. And if they More often or not, yes. Strong, healthy black children, those children are gonna go to school with a whole bunch of pride, a whole bunch of love for themselves. They're gonna tear up that they're gonna tear up that schoolwork. They're gonna be making 1500s on the SATs, and they probably gonna knock the white kids and other races and groups of kids out the water. Right. And I think that's the fear. The fear is don't let a black man and black woman get together because they're too powerful. If we promote the interracial agenda and the gay agenda to the black community, they could just fall for it. Yeah, but I mean, I don't think it's wise to, 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 to hold others accountable for your own problems. I think the black community... Oh, oh, the oh, I've got to push back on Brother Zongo. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Others accountable. First of I mean, all, she, she's saying there's an agenda. There is an agenda. Um, Please believe me, there is. There is an agenda. It's true. So then how then do you hold your future in your hands then? That was taken from us, and and so again when 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 they when the, the but I but I 
Oh, go ahead. I'm that's sorry. Like alleviate ourselves from any type of responsibility. That's not that's not the case. But that's, but that's what have, like she's she's kind of promoting right now. But there's, that, there's systems in place, and I see it every day on my job, that keeps mm -hmm. us divided. And because we, as a people, we're caught up in our own stuff that we're not seeing it from a bigger picture. Because this chat you have thousands of people, but we only got six, five people in here. But even though they're promoting um, these agendas, that doesn't mean we have to actually date. Okay, what I'm trying to say. Just because they're promoting, okay, say like if I see an interracial couple like on, you know, TV or something like that, th should I go out there and just go date a white person or a Chinese person just because I see that? I feel like we can kind of control that because you, we, we, we pick who we want to date. So even though we see that on TV, that doesn't mean I should just go out there and just date. I'm going to date who I want to date. I don't give a damn if they promoting black women, black women dating each other or not. I'm not going to go out there and date no black woman. You know what I mean? So I just feel like we do have a little bit of control of it. But that's just what I think. I mean, if you heard earlier, I was asking Lumumba, why do I hear why do I hear a lot about I mean, other people saying you shouldn't marry the black women. So it is obvious that a lot of people have recognized that there's a problem with the black woman. That's why they are choosing to date other women outside of their own race, right? So if I'm choosing to date... I, I, I get kind of sense when you say problem with the black women. There's, there's, there has never really been any type of real resources that have been put in place for us as black women to address I, some underlying needs can I in finish? terms of Cultural, they, the society does not want us to start addressing our needs from a cultural perspective because then again, like the sisters Trina Jackson, that will make us competitive. Yeah, but it's the thing not is, in their the, interest to put allow us to even have those systems in place to even create it for ourselves because when we do try to do it, we get pushed back. Yeah, but uh, I mean, it seems like you, you're just pointing the fingers on others instead of just recognizing the problem right now and finding the finding ways to address the problems, right? If men are I mean, dating outside, hold on the hold on a second. If men are dating outside of their own race or likelihood, or likewise, women are dating outside of race, right? This is the, so this is a problem. So the question is, why are they dating outside of the race? Is there a problem with their their counterpart? You know, then you you, you look deeper into that and find the problems and find the ways that you can address those problems instead of just blaming that there's a, a greater agenda outside trying to what. Uh, uh, divide you guys uh, in American society. I don't. I don't believe in that. Actually, it's not dividing. That's, us. They're trying to depopulate us. That's even. More. They're trying. Even in Ghana, they're trying to depopulate you with that LGB uh, with the LGBT agenda. They're trying to depopulate us. Trust me. They're trying to depopulate us. Well, I mean, I'm. I'm sorry for interrupting, but um, I don't really think. It's it's more black men dating black women, and I and it's in the eighty percent. So I don't think interracial uh, relationships is really a big problem in our community because it's mostly black women and black men dating each other. And I don't really think just because they're promoting this interracial and gay agenda, I still don't think our people they like who they like. Most black people are attracted to black people, so I don't think it's going to be a lot of risk. Um, shoot race mixing like they think how they came out with that magazine i think it, they said in 2053 or 2050 it's going to be a lot of mixed race people i don't think so i mean i really don't think so because i i still think black men are attracted to black women and i i, st I still think it's going to be in the 80 percent like when 2050 comes. So I really don't care what they're trying to promote because I really don't think that's going to happen. So well, well, that's what I have to say. And I think, I think the point that you're making is that this is pedestalized by the dominant culture, right? We know that eight, uh, only 8% 8 of black men are married to white women and only 4% of black women are married to white men. So the reality is this is something that's simply being pedestalized by the dominant culture, and as a result, it's created a, a sense of hyper visibility, right? Even though it's not reflective of the reality of our lived experiences in everyday lives. So, great point, Sister Shy. Sister Ash, I see you. You're finally tapped in. You in the mix. What's the word? 
And but a design, I'm still waiting for you to tap in, brother. I still need you to tap in. Come once, come all. I mean, Lamumba, what do you think about uh, some of the commentaries that the the your panelists just uh, stated that blaming the, the 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 outside forces as the source of the problem rather than just you know accepting the problem within your own community, <laughs> finding ways to address the problems. What right. do you think? So I'm trying to drink this wine, and you over here. <laughs> <laughs> so let me say this. I think two things, and I, I appreciate the question. Um, I think two things could be right at the same time. Um, and I, I've always said it on my channel, and I think anyone who's followed my channel is aware of the fact that I believe we have two enemies. One is the external enemy, right? We're talking about white hegemony, anti-black race, anti-blackness, which is pervasive and practiced by not only whites, but non-black people of color as well. But then we have the internal enemy. And that is what the racially disempowering, self-defeating, and self-destructive ways that we live our daily lives. But what we tend to focus on, and we tend to find is even in conscious circles, is to focus on the external and not the internal. Right? And, and the reason why I say that and I heard the conversation is, yes, we know that they in many aspects, they promote they promote the agenda. I thought this was hyperbole, but I've even come across it in, in my career in academia. We've even seen situations to where if a black young boy has long hair, they, the school administrator, particularly white school administrators, will put the boy in a dress. All types of nonsensical issues, right? However, what I would say as an adult, someone can't get you to engage in said behavior unless that's something that you are curious about or something that you always desire to be into. For example, I got some homies who are in prison right now. They locked up, they've been sent up, and they're doing their bid. And there are brothers who have been locked up 5, 10, 15, 20 years and have never engaged in a course homosexual activity. Then there are some who get in there and they engage in activity. And I'll make the argument of someone who has been incarcerated before but never sent to prison. If you engage in that behavior, it's because that's something that was always in you. All right, unless somebody is, is, is of course, uh, sexually assaulting you, that's a whole different conversation. But I, I, I think we tend to find a situation in which um, now, I will say this because I work in academia, that there is a culture uh, and, and there's a term called heteronormativity. I should do a show on heteronormativity and if it is actually uh, good or bad for the black community or is it harmful to the black community. But from a feminist and even from a LGBTQ or queer uh, 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 ide ideological frame of reference, the concept of heteronormativity argues uh, that, that believing that heterosexuality is normal is harmful to not only non-heterosexual people, but also the heterosexual people as well. This is the argument that they make. So there are some theories out there that do promote these types of ideas. KJ, I appreciate, I appreciate, I appreciate the super chat. Appreciate the super, super chat. 100%. Thank you. I hope you subscribed as well. Make sure you hit that like button and the notification bell. So what are you all thoughts on what I just, I just spoke to? I, I, I agree, but um, I, I agree. I agree. I thank you for answering that or clarifying mm -hmm. that question. Um, again, I really feel our, yes, our problems need to be addressed eternally, but mechanism has to be in place. There has to be something forceful within our community to happen so that key within us can be awakened so we can solve our issues. The, the, the um, the mechanism, mm -hmm. the, the mechanism should be replaced by whom? By ourselves or by external forces? It has to be replaced by us in order for it to work for it to be sufficient. Exactly. And as I said earlier, we we here on the Western Hemisphere, we have lost that key for survival, that key, that 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 key for us for survival and understanding the ancestors and those after us and understand that we're only here for a brief time and why we're here. We're setting up. We're preparing for the for the next generation, and if we were and we were to have that mindset, we would look at each other differently. We would interact with each other differently, and but we're caught up in materialism. Yeah, I, I'm with you there, sister. Our values should inform and dictate our behavior. Mm -hmm. I'm with you 100. percent And I and I tell people this all the time that, um, you know, I've had some rather deleterious experiences with black women. Um, but me being a Pan-Africanist, 
me actually pra believing in what I uh, actually practicing what I believe in is what pr prohibited me from going off the rails and and going my uh, I turn a junior on, on sisters. <laughs> you know what I mean? For lack of better words. So yeah. well, I'm with you 100% there. Some of our sisters are looking for some type of love or attention, but they don't know how to get it. So sometimes they, when they get a dude, they're mistreating him. Maybe because, you know, they're because of their dysfunction. They don't really know how to engage. That's mm -hmm. what I'm seeing. And vice versa. So now it's turned into this hurricane of a relationship. Like Ooh, I had, that's a good that's a good time, hurricane of a relationship. Yeah, because I had I, I had a client, you know, she got into a she wanted a boyfriend's attention, so she poked him. They were at the, at the train station, so she like poked him or something. I'm like, why you poked a man for? And they ended up a fight. The police had a call. I mean, it was just like, yeah. I, I guess she wanted more effect. I don't know. And but I'm like, you don't poke him. Right. <laughs> and and, and I, th I think one of the things just just period when we talk about relationships is that you have to um actually care about the person right and i i think people sometimes can get in relationships for a multitude of reasons but what i can say is when i have been in a relationship I actually genuinely cared about the person i was with i cared about what their best interests i cared about their well-being and i think that can play a, a huge role that even when you do have some rather emotionally volatile situations, it can prohibit you from engaging in, in behavior or even saying things that you will ultimately regret. I think that that's very true. That's very true. But again, because we don't live in it, many, because I work, again, live and work in an urban environment, we're, in, we're not, I, I don't see the love anymore you know like i said growing up at least when i was growing up we used to do each other's hair we used to we used to do certain things right. you used to do you know and you know boys would go out and, and just pick up a game and play football you know and hash it out and hash it out out there and next thing you know when they you know go somewhere that you know they're walking together you know we don't have those organic self-affirming activities anymore uh -huh. Uh, yeah, yeah, Michelle. Oh, go yeah. ahead. I'm sorry. No, I'm sorry, Ms. Um, Merrick. Please continue. Oh, no, no, no. Go ahead. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt. And the, like, for example, um, when one of, when somebody didn't have, we would come together even as, as teenagers. Okay, I know she needs I'm trying to get together. Okay, I got this. You, you know, we've lo I'm seeing this generation now lost that connection for, with each other. Mm-hmm. Or, you know, yeah, it's, it's just, again, because it, it's, it's a lot. I see a lot and, and it hurts me, you know, because, I, I, you know, at the end of the day, I need a job. I see the system putting all these policies again, you know, policies. I'm seeing aggressive gentrification in the D.C. area. Again, and speaking to not having a man in the house, um, I had a, I had a, a patient, may he rest his soul, he fought he didn't want his house to get gentrified and he told he told his family he used it he saw he said them n words better not sell my mf in house because he didn't want to be gentrified mm. <laughs> and the what and the uh i think the lady the realtor was a caucasian lady and got a, a, was upset saying he, he need counseling he needs psychiatric help <laughs> I just let it, it, he, he used more colorful language, but that's the warriorship they're afraid of. That's what they're afraid of. Even though, yes, he was weak, he was old, but he used his last breath to curse out that white lady that was trying to buy his home. Okay. Any other thoughts? Sister Love, as you've been waiting <laughs> patiently, so I definitely want to give you the opportunity to tap in and speak. Um, I mean, I didn't really have a comment. You just asked me to come on, so I came on. Well, yeah, because you know, you and Sister um, Shy, y'all were kind of having a um, a rather uh, loving debate um, of regarding attitudes. Some sisters have attitudes, some sisters don't. So I just wanted you all to be able to tap in and and share um, 
your perspectives on that. No, no, no. I mean, well, I wasn't trying to argue or be like debatable. I was just kind of like sharing my experience, like with dealing with um, some black women. I'm not, I mean, I'm not saying all, but um, just I can understand why some people will say that we do because like, um, I don't know, just the way some black women's personalities are like some, like I dealt with some with attitudes and stuff like that. And like, that's kind of why that's, that's kind of why I kind of stay to myself too. Like, I really don't have a lot of friends. I like, you know, because I'm just tired of dealing with the drama. I like, I don't want to like fight anyone or like, you know what I mean? Like get myself into some, you know, drama and stuff like that. Because like, like I said, when I was 18, some of that stuff did happen. I did get into a fight, you know, with like some, some of the black women I was date, uh, dealing with. And like, I'm tired of that. Like, I'm tired of fighting with my sister. I, I, I'm tired I, I, of I heard, you the one. I heard you was the one out acting like you were sure tonight. Don't try to put that on there. I'm, I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> well, I just, I like, I'm just, I'm just kind of tired of just fighting with my sisters and stuff like that. And just like the attitudes and stuff like that. So I just choose to stay to myself because like, I just don't, I don't want to end up with like, no, um, like de de uh, domestic violence case. Like, I just, I just don't want to have to deal with that, you know? And so I'm, and I'm not saying all sisters are like that, but I just, from what I went through, like, you know, from what I went through, I just choose to stay to myself and not, not that I'm not open to making any new friends and stuff like that, but I, I'm just kind of tired of it. So well, I, and, I'm, and I'm, I could, I, if I could, I think a great example is what took place with that sister who went to Mexico with her so-called friends for a vacation and they ended up killing her. Remember one was a trans person. One was a trans person. Yeah. I, I didn't know that, but I didn't know that. Stuff. You go on a vacation with a group of people that you think are your friends, and then you yes, jacked up. Appreciate you, Sister Carrie, for the for the for the super chat. Appreciation. I just want to say something. I am I am in agreement with Mary Shot Mary Shy because I'm at that age where I don't want to deal with drama either. Because all my life, I didn't grow up in the hood, okay? I grew up a military brat when I was a kid. Okay. And my, my family moved to, I live in San Antonio, Texas. And I've been here since I was 13. I'm 50 now. And most of my life, to be honest with you, I had to fight. Not literally fight a lot, but I had to stand up for myself. Right. And it, it the, most of it had to do with jealousy of me because I wasn't ghetto enough. I was smart and I could do that schoolwork. So it was more like, who do you think you are? And I know how Mary feels because I'm at the point where I got like three female friends that I'm cool with. Everybody else is high and by because... You have to understand something too, Mary. A lot of black women are broken, and a lot of black women, unlike black men, don't they don't grow up with fathers in the home either. So you're dealing with a lot of some of these sisters that are just angry, bitter, have attitudes because of their environment and their situation. And then when they get around women like us, sometimes those women feel threatened. And they get in, you know, well, jealous mode. Does anyone agree yeah, with that? I, I agree with I agree with Miss Jackson's sentiment, yes. Okay. okay, but when I was saying that, y'all was like, oh, you making excuses. <laughs> clap back, sit love. Clap, clap back. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, yeah, Sanquilla mm -hmm. Robinson, that was the sister who went to Mexico on a vacation, and the people she was there with, all of the individuals were black, someone in that group ended up killing her. That's jacked up. That's just that has to be unacceptable. Unacceptable. We can't accept that type of behavior. We have to. We as a people too. When black people kill other black people, we got to call that out, and we can't excuse that either, because right. what they did was wrong. What they but, did to that woman was wrong. Indeed, that was that was disastrous. That uh, was terrible. But but and also I, I want to. I do add, have some. 
Go, go ahead. I'm sorry. I wanted to add that, you know, like when I came over here, right, coming from Ghana, I mean, we're all black over there, right? But we never thought that, oh, every black person is here broader because I'm on the black people in Ghana. They have like, you know, um, they have criminals, they have good people, they have people with, you know, good uh, moral values and stuff like that too. We don't, we don't think that every like black person is like your brother. There's a likelihood that you can find someone who is a criminal or someone who has bad behavior or someone with bad morals that you don't want to associate yourself with. So we don't really think from that angle. Even So when I came over here, the kind of like ide- ideology that is being promoted within, I don't know, probably like the Pan-African community or maybe the black community that every black person is your brother. It was just, it's just very hard for me to digest because I know that that person is not a good person. It's a bad person. And I'm not going to vouch for him in case anything, uh, uh, if he commits a crime or something like that. So it's, it was very, very hard for me when I do hear some of the black people uh, make commentaries that, oh, every black person is your brother. It was just very hard for me. So I- um, yeah, uh, Sister Trina? Uh, yes. Oh, oh, yes, sorry. Um, I kind of understand what you're saying, but, like, I, like, I, like you said, I didn't, I didn't grow up in a hood either, but, um, I didn't have a father around. I do know my father, and we, we do have a relationship now, but you, like you said, like, I mean, I did, have an attitude problem like back in the day like you know um like but 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 i but i got therapy i had got therapy and like i feel like some black women uh they they won't go to therapy and it like i I was so angry about a lot of things i was angry i was depressed and like when i was like hmm was it like 24 around 24 23 25 i was getting therapy uh um, I went to like a Christian counselor and I wouldn't, well, I'm not saying I wouldn't go back to her again, but, um, she, she, she's a, she's a nice person, but, um, like if I do go back to therapy, which I do plan to do because like I still, I still have some stuff that I'm going through. Like, I don't mind going to therapy. And I think sometimes us as black people, we look down on therapy. There's nothing wrong with therapy. We all need someone to talk to, you and know, I, but, but, I, but, but a, lot of that, a lot of that, I'm going to apologize for cutting you off, but a lot of the negative views of therapy comes from, of course, the Christian background. All you got to do is give it to Jesus. Right. And we know that that's not how things actually work. So a lot of that, of course, comes from the indoctrination that many people, not only just in black community, but whole in America, period, have with, of course, uh, Christianity. Right. And so therapy actually helps, you know, Kevin Samuels, you know, a lot of people took umbrage with his his way of his way of uh, talking to people and the way he viewed the world. But he was a huge proponent and advocate of therapy. And I will say this as someone who's gone through therapy which is part of the reason why I'm not serving 25 to life, right? Um, is that oftentimes a Christian-based therapy or church-based therapy actually isn't therapy at all. So, and we, and, and I would make an argument because I have some friends who are black psychologists that the therapy we should be receiving should be African-centered in nature. Yes, right? yes, so yes. That's very yes. important. So brother, uh, a bemused observer says we should all go to therapy, man and woman. I agree 1,000%. 1,000%. And then let me say this, because I know oftentimes when children are having issues, people say, I'm going to take my child to therapy. I disagree with that. The first therapist should be the parent. Okay? The first therapist should be the, te- should be the parent. Then if you see, okay, this child needs some professional help, then maybe you should go and take them. Because I can, I can recall growing up, my parents or my therapist, when I had a problem, when I was feeling a certain way, when I doubted myself, when I was questioning my person, my being, my ability to do X, Y, Z, it was my parents that I went to that I had those deep, constructive int- uh, uh, conversations with, introspective um, conversations with. Um, Brother Lumbumba, I can understand that, but sometimes... I couldn't go talk to my mom. Like mm. some like she'll just be very short with stuff. I mean, I love my mom, but wow. she'll be very short with stuff. And I That's just it. felt I just didn't feel comfortable really after well, after her see. being so short for a long time. I just yeah. couldn't. Let me yeah. ask you this. Do you have an older sibling? 
No, I'm the oldest out of all my siblings. Oh, I have a okay. sister that's a year younger than me, but okay. I have I'm the oldest one out of all my siblings. Okay. So so for me, I, I had it like I had the best of both worlds because I also was the baby in the family. And my parents' favorite, by the way. My parents' favorite, by the way, right? And so I could go to my older sister, my older brother, and I went to my older brother a lot. We were extremely close growing up. But I would also say this. Um, well, I so with my children, particularly my son and my daughter, but my son, I would always tell him whenever you, and I've told him this since he was a toddler, whenever you want to talk, I'm available. And so now that he's a teenager, he'd be like, hey, I need to talk to you about something. And you have to because you made me. He would say that. And I'm like, well, duh, I know this. And I told you that when he was three years old. And I told him, I said, hey, whenever you want to talk, I'm available to talk. And I have to talk to you because I made you. Right. And so just I think it's very important, those of us who are parents or prospective parents, to just be available for your child. And oftentimes can prevent them from engaging in behaviors that could be extremely harmful to their lives. So just being available. And, and you know, I, I think part of that is just prioritizing what is most important. And for me, I, I, I've always have prioritized uh, having conversations with my children. Sometimes, you know, they're at the age now where they don't want to talk, but I'm like, we're going to have this conversation anyway, right? You know, but um, just something to consider and be cognizant of. But also, some, some parents may not, because of the environment, you got to be recognized. Some parents may actually may not be able to, you know, feel they are able to talk to their children. And that's where we need a community where sometimes parents need support they can reach out to to have those supportive conversations right. um, and, I, and i've done that like there may be something that happened with my children i call one of the brothers hey or one of the elders hey mm -hmm. this is what happened what should i do right <laughs> literally there's a time i mean there was a time something happened with my son i call like six different elders and a couple brothers and said this is what took place what should i do right so Having that that community, as you stated, having that network, having that, that 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 group who is there for you when you need them to be. I mean, there's even brothers I text almost every morning. Hey, what's going on, brother? Da, 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 da. I got this going on. Blah 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 blah. Because we have to understand, we can't do things by ourselves. But we live in a system that tells you you should do things by yourself. Who freaking cares? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Right. I mean, and so and, and I say that not, not, you know, not to be smug or arrogant, but we have to think for ourselves as a people. Because that's, that's as much as the system, as pervasive as the system is, we know Patricia Hill Collins in her seminal book, uh, Black Feminist Thought, talks about the matrix of domination. They don't control what takes place in your household. Yeah, I think Michelle tends to blame the system. You know, you can you can control your own destiny, you know. Mm -hmm. You can do that. You can have your own values and within your own household and ensure like your kids you know conform and abide to that as well. Instead of just blaming them. You you recognize the problem outside. So how then do you prevent your kids or your family mm -hmm. from subscribing to those values outside? You have to create your own values within your own household and then kids, you know, abide and conform to that. I think it's possible because I mean I don't have any kids. But it's something that I, I do listen to channels like, you know, Lumumba and other like black communities, you know, some of the problems like, you know, um, raising kids uh, here in Washington state is the most liberal state that I've, you know, I've heard uh, the, the kids uh, being trained about this, um, the uh, uh, LGBT community. I've heard a lot about that. And I, I, I'm trying to devise a way in case I do have my kids. How do I prevent them from, you know, getting influenced by this, you know? Yeah, I, I, think, I think that's a great segue. I mean, I've talked to my kids about LGBTQ+. Plus. I've talked to my kids about transgender. You know, we sat down and just... And really, I just wanted to see what they had to say, right? And of course, I raised my children to be intellectuals, to be autodidacts, um, and to really be uh, intellectually curious and to be critical of particular things. So when I sat down and, and talked to them, you know, they were able to show a level of, of uh, criticality, right? and introspective thinking that I was like, okay, I'm out here doing my mother flood fucking job. Okay. You know what I mean? Um, and so I think, I think so, but, and I think we have to have those conversations because if you don't have those conversations first with your children, 
what would happen is the school would then teach them something and the child would believe it, hold it to be true. Be true. Exactly, right? So this is why it has to start at home. So uh, some, just something to be cognizant of. Like I said, a lot of times, you know, I'm in my doctoral program and I come across particular theories or ideas. I share them with my children. Hey, what do you think about this, right? And I mean, one time my daughter was like, that doesn't make any sense. In fact, she even parroted some of the language I use and she said that is nonsensical. I said, that's what I'm talking about. Use those SAT words, right? You know what? Right? So uh, just something exactly. to be cognizant of. But the work starts at home. And I think first and foremost, we know as parents, I'm a parent, and there may be some other people on the, on the panel or who are parents, but you're not going to have all the answers. But what truly helps, in my personal opinion, is not being a lazy parent. If you are an engaged and active and involved parent, if you are the opposite of someone who is a lazy parent, you could get a lot done. Exactly. And I think this is where, like, the men are really needed in the family to kind of, like, you know, instill the values and discipline mm -hmm. in the household as well, right? Like, mm -hmm. it's really needed. So if you don't have the men out there, uh, it just becomes it just becomes a challenge for the for the for the mother as well. It, it does, but of course, from a feminist perspective, um, that is what is best. Right? Oh, really? Oh, wow. <laughs> no, literally, literally, literally. I had, I, like I stated, I was having a conversation in my class two weeks ago because spring break right now, right? So I was living the vita without the loca this week, right? <laughs> and um, we in the class we were talking about patriarchy. And the young lady, young lady stated that um, she wasn't young. I think she was older than me. But anyway, um, she stated that she understood how patriarchy was harmful to even men because the husband was out with their son or, or their, their, their infant child. And people thought that maybe he had uh, kidnapped the baby or something. And I said, well, first off, that's not patriarchy. Patriarchy doesn't posit that men are incompetent fathers and incompetent caregivers. I said, feminist ideology posits that that men are dangerous to their own children and the whole class got quiet but the reason why she was even able to promote that narrative is because oftentimes in higher ed most of the individuals who are in higher ed have been socialized or even indoctrinated with the ideology of feminism that they but they hold those things to be true even when they're patently false yeah yeah so I said, that isn't patriarchy. That's feminist ideology that would cause someone to believe that if a man is sitting there holding an infant child, he must be about to do something nefarious to the child or he's kidnapped the baby. Ain't no man ever sit there and said, oh, that dude got a baby in his hand. We need to call the police. Oh, really? Is that how they think over here? <laughs> yeah, right. No, I, I said, no. I said, no man has ever done that. That's something that you only get from women and particularly women who are feminists. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. Yeah. So I was like, no, that's, that's not that's terrible. not patriarchy. We're gonna we gonna I said we're gonna cut the bullshit out right now. You get the sharpest knife in your kitchen, you cut the bullshit out right now. Yeah, the feminists. Yeah, well, the reason why I have issues with the feminists because a lot, a lot of our programming that's supposed to help black youth. When I was working on outpatient mental health, we wanted to do a program for the black for the black boys. Then we had this white girl from uh, I don't know, she was from the Midwest. And she raised Cain about the whole situation. Um, again, not understanding the dynamics of being, you know, just being black in America, period. Just totally, totally disregarded everything and wanted to write letters. So we even had to disband the program we wanted to do uh, just for black boys. So, and there was another incident where I had, I had, I was working with a young man and he was going through some, you know, personal hygiene issues. And so I, I wanted to get one of the, uh, our support workers to talk to him because he was a man, a black man. And I, I, I think that I said, that would be more appropriate for him, for a man to talk to him about those type of things. He was like, right. no, you trained, you, you got a degree. You should be able to talk to him about that. I said, I, I understand that, but you also got to respect his personhood. You know, he's still a Mac person coming of age. So he may, you know, have some feelings about me talking to him about those type of care needs. So let's see if XYZ can talk to him and see how that goes. And left it at that with her. And, you know, if, and then if anything happened, I would, you know, I, I told my supervisor about it, that I'm going to let XYZ talk to him about personal care issues. Right. And, and you know, personally, I'm not a fan of cross gender mentoring, but thank I, you. I'm, I'm not a fan of that at all. We tend to find uh, in these type of situations, mm -hmm. um, 
um, in which individuals tend to take those positions of power and use them to manipulate one opposed individual into having a sexual relationship with them. So even when I had my nonprofit organization, the Coalition of African Unity, uh, I let them know from the get go, we do not do cross gender mentoring. If a sister needs mentorship, it's going to come from another sister. If a brother needs mentorship, it's going to come from another brother. We're going to cut the BS out right now. We're not going to allow that shit to take place. When the when Brother Zungo says the system, the system, this was a um, program sponsored by the county to help people. But we have this white liberal ideas coming into a community that generally needs help. And the community is coming to us for help because they do need it. But however, hidden in it, there is an agenda in it. And this lady from Michigan, what where Midwest State she is, is trying to impose it. But because that we, I, you know, me and some others push back a little bit. Uh, luckily, the program has been disembarked because of the um, pandemic. But who's to say when it comes back up, somebody like her won't come back three times fold and fire all the black, all the, all the people that push back against us. And the next thing you know, you're indoctrinating a new um, generation with some ideology. Is that in the school system or what? No, it was an outreach program for the community. Oh, okay. I mean. <sighs> Any other thoughts? Regarding um, the topic and, of course, the comments that Sister Michelle just made. So, yes, you that is a great point oftentimes that there are outreach programs in the community or even in certain schools that the ideology of the programming tends to not be congruent with the needs of the black community and black people that's why i've, I've always made the argument in fact i just um submitted a paper for a public uh, a, a manuscript for publication regarding the need for pre-college counter spaces and how they need to be rooted in african-centered uh, Africans in the ethos. So when and if I would say when that that manuscript is published, I would definitely do a show on that publication. So be on the lookout for that. Hopefully within the next uh, three to six months. But any uh, maybe final thoughts before we close out? Well, I think this was a great show regarding the husband son crisis and the rise of the homosexual in the <clears throat> black community. As we know, a homosexual is a gender neutral term. A homosexual could be male or female. And a homosexual is someone who seeks out a relationship with a particular individual to what allow themselves to have a place to stay. Um, but I think when we talk about the husband-son crisis, this, of course, is a actual um, phenomenon that we tend to find in our community in which women of means, women who have uh, achieved a certain level of social, economic, uh, academic, and even intellectual prestige, seek out relationships with men of a lower status and oftentimes it's to be able to dictate or wear the quote unquote pants in the relationship. So any final thoughts on the husband son concept of crisis uh, before we close out? I, I wanted to ask the sister Michelle that, um, do, do you believe like the, the black kids who study or learn within black kids or did she also learn within, you know, uh, kids from diverse background or race? What, what's your thought on that? Yeah, if, if I if I could have my way, I first think like what uh, what Brother Luma say, African centered uh, theories. Uh, first, we need self affirming and self affirming education before you put us in this, these diverse groups, so that we can have a solid foundation when we go into these diverse groups. Because a lot, when I see in my community, the foundation is not there in terms of self affirmation, self esteem, and just self awareness. Once that's done, yes, I believe that child will be ready to go into more diverse groups and be able to take care of themselves. Um, yes, I do believe in diverse groups, but the foundation has to be there for that child so they can go there and interact as needed and oh, be okay. successful. Well, that, that kind of makes sense. I do agree with that. Okay. I mean, if and, you can um, and then for in reference to the homosexual and man-son relationship, again, that again, it started post 1970s. Once the economic imbalance happened with the man and woman, um, again, 
once they attack the man, which is the warrior class. Not physical, no, not the warrior okay. class. I, I see you teaching, sister. Okay, okay, I see you. All right, I know that's right. Go right ahead. It's the warrior. Is it was the warrior class? Because a, a, a man, a man can only teach another man. Period. Um, and once, and reason why I think we as black women are so keen on making more money and keen on have that drive because this system has taken controls the wealth and balance of everything, so that men, black men in this country, aren't able to achieve a level of success unless they're playing sports, they're entertaining. And then a lot of them are in a different, you know, different mindset when when they get into those words. So they're not even reflecting on the on the community. Yes, they may do a turkey drive, they may come and do a clothes drive, or you know, something like that. But they're not really invested in the community as they should be with their or could be with their wealth. But um, that's a whole nother discussion for another day. Mm -hmm. And the sun is it, going it, to. It's sad because I think because it's such a uh, pandemic in our community. That's why we're being gentrified. Again, like I was telling you the story of the of the man who cursed the who cursed the white lady out. They don't who cursed the white lady out because they were trying to take his home and try to say he had something wrong with him. That's what the warrior does. The warrior protects his no matter what to to the to his death, and that's what they don't want to see, and that's what they try to minimize. So therefore, when you don't have a man teaching another man how to be a warrior, now we have these homosexuals, man-son relationship. Again, we as women don't have the community just to uh, support our sisters so they can be, you know, re you know, be safe in their femininity and allow men to be men and so we can be feminine. Thank you. All right. Seattle Slideshow, just let you tap in. What's the word? Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Just fine. Indeed. Yeah, I think for the most part, you know, because I know you say you were closing it out. But hey, absolutely. We can, hey, we, can, we can stay on a little bit longer. I'm drinking some wine, brother. Oh, OK. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I definitely think that the, you know, is it a crisis, you know, with the, the whole we're talking about the son husband thing, right? Uh, no, the husband son, not son husband, but husband son. Oh, okay. Yeah, so the hus so we we're familiar with the son husband, right? The son husband is a situation in which the the son of the mother takes on the emotional role, the emotional labor of acting as acting in a role as if the actual husband was there, right? But the husband's son is a situation in which women of means, particularly uh, who have accomplished, who are accomplished women, socially, economically, academically, even intellectually have pursued relationships with men of lower status so that they could wear their pants in a relationship. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, I've been hearing about that in the Black Man here for a while now. Mm. I personally haven't experienced it. Okay. But so but, but you mentioned it. you've heard about this in the Black manosphere. What are some of the things that you've heard? I mean, absolutely. It even brings me back to like when I would hear, you know, um, BGS's panel, some of the people that would go up there, Ramil, some of Ramil's heated debates, people would say, or let's say brothers would even say, you get more. This is what they were saying. You know, they're saying, this isn't my experience um, okay. with uh, Black women here in the States, at least. But they would say, you get further even with some Black women if they see that you don't have much or they mm. see. I know the guys on Ramil's panel were saying like they had more success dealing with black women in like Atlanta, St. Louis, Oakland, when all they had was like literally a blow up mattress and like a studio apartment. Wow. Versus um, when they got their money up and stuff, that's when kind of like the ego comes out or they didn't, they weren't really checking for them as much or they would get like attitude or something. That's what they said. But wow. I could believe it. From my experiences in Seattle with the the few black women I, I encountered out there. So you said you had some experiences in Seattle. Uh hopefully, hopefully you're not sleeping since Seattle, right? That, that's <laughs> like, that's a weak ass joke. I, I'm I'm a cornball, right? So, uh, so talk, talk, talk to me about uh, some of those experiences that 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 you've had. Well, the, the ironically, um, you do. I have met quite a few. I didn't, you know, I met a lot of black women, but also I didn't meet many. 
considering how long I was out there, but the few that I met that were actually not from like Africa or like the West Coast, because in my opinion, black women that are like born and raised on the West Coast, they're completely different okay. than women out East like from the South, but uh -huh. the ones that were like from the East, like let's say Georgia or New York, it's almost like as soon as I encounter them, it's almost like they come at me kind of like, you got to prove yourself before you even, it's almost like they don't believe that you're a well-to-do brother out there with like mm -hmm. means to you, if that makes sense. So okay. I would hang out with my Brazilian friends a lot and they worked at Microsoft. And like a good example is we were, what we usually did on the weekends, we would, you know, go around, talk to different people, talk to the, you know, you know, tolerate some women and stuff. And it was this table of these Asian girls, uh, one white chick and a black chick. And I'm bringing this up because this is like a, a typical scenario. So as usual, you know, we sit down, talk with them, we're vibing, blah, blah, blah. And out of nowhere, the black girl, she crosses her arms and she's just like <laughs> kind of giving us that face. Just like, where are you guys from? And we're like, uh, you know, well, he's from Brazil. You know, I moved out here from uh, the south, blah, blah, blah. And she's like, uh, what do you guys do? We're like, oh, he works in Microsoft. You know, at the time, I was doing, like, uh, my podcast thing, some digital marketing stuff. It's like, uh, do you have any proof of that? Like, you have a website? Do you have a this? Do you have that? I'm like, I'm like, no. And by the way, like, no other woman that I had dealt with before her had asked me nothing like this in Seattle. Okay. Um, and this, like, that's an example. I'm not going to go through the whole story, but long story short, she killed the vibe. We had to get up, blah, blah, blah. But it's almost like they, if you, I can see probably where Ramil and his homeboys were coming from. If you come at them kind of like uh, Kevin Samuels type vibe, it's almost like they look for reasons to be like, okay, he he really might not be about shit. So let me see if he's even. But if you just come at him like a Pukio or Ray Ray, you know, right. like, like, how, like how they claim that probably doesn't happen to you as much. I mean, I don't present myself that way, so I'm not sure, but I wouldn't be surprised if what they're saying is true. So, yeah, I can and, definitely. And, 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 and to speak to that, brother, you know, a lot of times what tends to take place is if you come off, like you said, as a Ray Ray, as a Pookie, what can transpire is there's the belief that you are someone who's unintelligent and therefore you you could be easily manipulated. Yeah. Right, and so if you're easily manipulated, and hey, I love to be with this guy because he's gonna be like a dog on a leash. When I say get him, boy, he's just gonna go. Right, rather than someone who is intelligent, analytical, and, and, and exhibits a amount of what emotional maturity. Right, that's someone who wouldn't be easy to manipulate. So absolutely, I see where you're coming from. Go right ahead. Yeah, no, I mean, I would. It sounds like it makes perfect sense, and like what Ramil and them were saying for the most part was. It's all in, they almost got to the dark side of it, like how a lot of them, like almost like want to fit, like one, like a fixer upper. That's kind of what mm. they were conveying. Like they want to do where it's almost like they, the guy has to rely on them and that gives them power. That's like, yeah, I remember now they were saying like they feel powerful when it's when he makes less than them, when they can control them, when he, like, oh, he's only, he's living in a studio with a blow up mattress. Okay, I could, he needs me. But if they meet a dude, like, I don't know, then your brothers on this panel or like uh, your average brother in Seattle, Washington, working at Microsoft is a whole different ball game. So maybe the energy is different. So, Right. And I would say this as well. And I think you're making some good points. Um, as I told my daughter, we don't deal with projects. You're talking about the men building the men up, right? Yeah. I said, we don't do that. Yeah. At all. For real. So if you want to get smacked, okay, bring a mofo in here that, you know what I mean? Like, seriously, <laughs> talking about you trying to help him get on his feet. Like, you go, boy. <laughs> All right, go out of here, brother. Well, she, she, bring, she bring him back and she's like, yeah, man, I just need a place to sleep, man. Gotta smack the shit out your ass. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> go, go out of Go out of here. What is the problem of the lady helping you to get on your feet? Uh, so here's the thing I, I would say, you know, and this is just for me being a man. Uh, like, I have a female friend. Like, she's even helped me fix my car before. She knows more about cars than me, right? And so she had the information. I was like, all right, you can tell me what to do, but I'm still going to do it myself. So, and, and this might be rooted in maybe some traditional 
and even some people would even call toxic concepts of masculinity. But I think for the most part, men should not be dependent on women to care for them or help them move forward in life. Oh, okay. Okay. I would actually meet you in the middle on that one. I would say I agree with you completely on that one for okay. the U.S. Now, when I was in Romania, when I was in um, Poland, Latvia is completely different because the culture is different. How the women treat you are different. Their their values are different. I would say out there, they still expect you to definitely be the man, but it's a lot to explain. But I think like culturally, is a bit more acceptable. And um, if I saw a man like you know being helped build himself up with a woman out there, it would be different versus here. It's a lot more cutthroat and stuff. Okay. That's cool. I appreciate that, brother. Appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, exactly. Because I also went to college. Um, I did my master's over here, but I did my master's, uh, my undergrad when I was in Turkey. And I dated a Turkish lady over there. I mean, she was obviously richer than I was. But then, I mean, even though like she kind of helped me, but it wasn't like she didn't exert her dominance over me. Right? Right. I, I, I just, yeah, I, and I got you. I, I just, you know, um, that's just your comment, Sister Shy. I don't know. I just, I just feel a certain way about, um, I guess, depending on a woman financially. Like, I'm not saying that a woman can't help a brother and it could be on the up and up and the guys, and you know, it's, I don't know. It just makes me feel a certain way, I guess. Yeah, no, I, I, I completely agree with you. It's not like I'm not even speaking in terms of financially, but then maybe the person understands the culture quite uh, better than you do, and then the person can also help you to kind of navigate within their own cultural system. Mm -hmm. society where they come from right so that was that, that was the angle that i was thinking of when i think about helping as well okay well i think out here especially in like the north america i even put canada and i probably even throw in uk australia but okay i think here is almost like the women kind of detest you in a way if they got to help you because how our culture is set up and it's not even just black men you know period you can see white men white women especially nowadays how they talk to their men about it. It's almost like if 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 they gotta help you out here, they look at you as like lower than or like, you know, girl, he needed my help to take me to the store, blah, 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 blah. Or if it's a white woman, you know, it's just like, oh yeah, Kelly, maybe you shouldn't see him or look for a man more established. Like they don't really it's almost like shame if you gotta help a man. Whereas in Eastern European countries and especially in Asia, um, the woman is that you're a part you're actually a team you know it's actually mm -hmm. egalitarian the, the man helps the woman and the woman helps the man okay yeah that's how it, that's what i would say on that got you okay i appreciate you putting us on game brother yeah absolutely well me personally i do not mind working with a brother just give me something to work with <laughs> 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 Because most of the time when I get with these brothers, I'm the one that doing all I'm the one that ends up doing all the work majority of the time. I'm tired. <laughs> <laughs> I'm telling the truth. I now, now, but now you know the argument that many would make is if that's the case, then why are you fooling with them? Uh, true, but it just, just tired. I mean, I'm, I'm just saying, like for me, like I've 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 had some sisters come at me who are projects. And I'm like, nah, I'm good. You know what I mean? So at the end of the day, that I mean, you relationships are reflective. You know what I mean? So if you're dealing with someone who doesn't have anything going for them, for example, there, there's a sister I used to mentor, and I know I mentioned I'm not into cross um, cross gender mentoring, but this was the sister who I was cool with when we were an undergrad, and she ended up joining the organization I was part of. And long story short, this is a sister. She's a Pan Africanist. We know what Stokely, Stokely Carmichael, also known as Carme Torre, taught us that what Pan Africanism is the highest form and representation of Black power. So, this sister had a, a two bachelor's degrees, a minor in Spanish, and she was dating a guy who didn't even have a driver's license. And I said to her, You need to really sit down and ask yourself a question Why are you dealing with men like this? I said, You for real? Because you really need to ask yourself, why are you dealing with homosexuals? Why are you dealing with husband sons and you got your ish together? And for crying out loud, you a pan Africanist. And she said, you know what? You're right about that. And sometimes it's the fact that some women, not all, 
don't want to deal with a man who's on the level because they know what would come with that is a is male accountability. Just kind of gotta keep it a buck. Yep. That and then I, plus I also think me, <clears throat> I have to, I'm gonna admit my problem too is I have an E40 in the click, Captain Save a Whole Complex. And that's, mm. and that's a, and I will admit that that's a downfall of me. Okay. And I've always been, I've been like, in the past, I've been like, get with these men and they really didn't have nothing. Not saying I'm all that in a bag of chips, but. Right. Well, sister, um, on this show, it ain't a bag of chips. It's a bag of flaming Hot Cheetos, okay? <laughs> a, a bag of flaming Hot Cheetos. <laughs> and I was the one doing. I was. I was the one doing all the work. Like I would give these men, these brothers, and it was. They didn't, and majority of them didn't even have a car. I had to get in my car and go pick these, these men up. Just so very quickly, sister. I'm gonna push back just a little bit. You didn't have to. You chose to. Yes. Right. Cause just like how I said, if a woman has a baby. I exit stays left. If that man said, I don't have a vehicle, I don't have a job, you could have exit, exited stage right. So you didn't have to, you chose to. Matter of fact, I remember when I was younger. This is when I was a young buck, 18, 19, 20. If I if there was a time where I didn't have a job, I didn't even I didn't even hit on a woman. I wouldn't even talk to a female if I knew I didn't have a job. So once again, I, I, I and I'm just pushing back. I understand your story, sister. I'm not saying your narrative is 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 a uh, farcical in nature, but we have to understand that we have a choice, and oftentimes we choose to do things, but then say that we have to. All right, but Lamu, you also have to understand that sometimes you know you can meet a person from scratch. You understand their own problem. The person understand your own problems. And you can build together to you know to, to be in a very strong relationship as well. Because usually. Because now, like, I mean, I, preferably, I would like to find a lady, right, that um, doesn't know that I'm working right now. Probably I was in college, and she was in college, and we meet together because we know we didn't have anything when we met. And then eventually, when we start working, we, we have a reason to stay together and to build together. Mm -hmm. right? But now that I'm working, you know, the person knows this is your, the work that the kind of work that you do. And the moment, like, the brother from Seattle saying that, oh, he works at Microsoft. Immediately, the person thinks money, right? Money, money, money. <laughs> <laughs> so even if like you are working, maybe the person might think, "Oh, I might, I might probably get money from this guy, or you mm -hmm. know, it's gonna be better for me on the other side." So it's really challenging, you know. It's really hard to kind of like know where is like the fine line to kind of navigate in in relationship as well. Careful. I had a client uh, who dated a guy who had a high level job, and you know, nice looking young lady, you know had some elements she stole his she stole his identity so please be careful well my take on this is uh, I'm, i guess i'm a bit old school hmm. on this one <laughs> in the sense of birds of a feather flock together come on and when i say that one perfect example and i mean i know it's not just me so i'm not only here saying oh you know i'm in certain circles so i'm better than all. i'm just saying like for me personally, I don't even any, if I went down my friends list, my contacts, I don't know. None of my friends are, I don't know any of you um, black men that don't have jobs, aren't driven, right? you know, lacking driver, driver's license and so on and so on, maybe because of, you know, who I'm connected to or whatever. But that doesn't mean that you yourself have to be making six figures before you're dealing with people who do make six figures or who do have a lot going on in life. I think Right. From my experience from traveling, I think a lot of us deep down inside, we don't like to get out of our comfort zone, not even just in the sense of, you know, confidence and self-esteem. Just like an example, let's say maybe um, let, let's uh, switch it. Let's say I'm complaining, man, I'll, I'm dealing with all these women, they ain't shit, blah, 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 blah. They're ghetto. OK, cool. But if I go, I don't know, maybe if I'm in Newark, New Jersey or Bronx, New York, maybe I need to go down to Manhattan and see if I can hang around some women around there. Or you guys get what I'm saying? I think for the most part, uh, environment is a big thing, but also you got to surround yourself around different types of people 
to really change the type of people that you're hanging around with. That's um my opinion on that. You're absolutely right. And I'll tell you well, since you're from since you're from Seattle, this one time I went to Tacoma, right, to see what I I can like, you know, socialize with the black people over there. But the kind of mentality they had over here, I'm like, no, I don't want to be part of these people. <laughs> I want to move far away from them, man. <laughs> Are you saying I'm talking about Tacoma? Yeah, because my way of thinking and the other way of thinking is like it's it's like diametrically opposite. So, <laughs> and I agree with you. I agree with you on that point. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I, I do need to get a sister train. train. Yes, yes, Mary. Mary. Oh, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt you. I do need to get out of San Antonio because this city here now. Their mentality is work menial jobs and have cigarette m- weed beer money. Mm-hmm. But you know what, I don't Sister think Trina? Probably I probably thinks that way. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, Sister Trina, I, I definitely understand you because, yeah, I, I learned a very big, big, big lesson. I say, I, I mean, sometimes I don't mind helping a man, but. I'm not going to help them too, too much. Cause like I said, I learned a very big, big lesson. Um, I have helped men out before and um, I'm not saying this happened to me, but this happened to a Sierra Leone sister who I was talking to. Like Mm -hmm. she was helping, she was with her children's father. They was both together and she was helping them out that, you know, they got a house together. She had brought a brand new car. Next thing you know, he kicked her out and now he didn't got this one girl married her and now he in there um she in there living with the house that they they bought and the car that she bought and stuff like that and she didn't put the car in her name i think she put it in his name and stuff like that but it was brought by her and stuff like that i i'm sorry but i'm not helping no more men out i'm not i'm sorry like i mean i did what i did and it was a, a very big lesson. I mean, I mean, I'm not trying to tell, you know, but um, I, no, not not anymore. I mean, I don't mind helping with, with a little bit, but like as far, I'm not putting no man's car. I mean, I mean, I'm not putting, I'm not putting, no, 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 no. I'm not going to have my name on, you know, uh, if it's, if we're going to buy a house, it's going to be our name on it. I'm not, I mean, we're going to be married first, then we're going to purchase the house and stuff like that. But I'm not, if you're not, if I, if you're not going to marry me, I'm not, don't put my name in nothing. I'm not, no. So I, I, I know mean, that's right. I think women, yeah. the, the narrative was, the narrative that's told women, this is what I'm hearing with black women though. They, they're saying that the problem with you black women is you don't work with your men. Look at the white women, the Latino women, the Asian women. They work with their men to build empires and things like that. But the problem with you black women is you want results now. Yeah, but I mean, well, the you lady- know what, Sister Trina? I like, I like, I tr- I'm trying to do that, but I feel like some of these, some of these men need help too much. And I just, I think, I'm sorry, sister. I just think we should leave them alone. Let them figure out on their own because, like, you, I don't, we don't, t- at the end of the day, we don't know what they're, like, are they, are they using us um, just to get what they want? And then when they get their self together, money together, are they going to leave me and go be with the woman who they really want? You know what I mean? I'm just saying because this happened to a Sierra Leone sister. I'm not I doing mean, it no more I'm, just, I'm too old. I'm, I'm not doing it no more. I'm not. Mm-mm. I'm not no, doing it. No I'm sorry. I'm too old. I'm too old. I'm 50 and I don't have time for yeah. all that. Work with a president, do right. all the work. Yeah, I mean, Sister Trina, I'm just saying because I worked very hard. I went, I worked overnight and I went to school during the day, and sometimes I would sleep during my classes, but I made it. I made it to be a nurse, and I'm not saying a nurse is a big cane job, but I'm just saying, I'm not, I'm not doing it anymore. Men are going to have to work very hard like I did. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah, but a lady, uh, the Sarah. Sarah Sarah Leung lady, she made a mistake, right? She should have married before trying to build a house or build, you know, buy buy a car for for the man. That was that was. Well, she well she said, well she was saying she wanted to get married, but she was saying that she was like Sarah Leung men, they don't like to marry. Like I mean, and I I can't 
I think she was, I mean, she's Sierra Leona, but I, I feel in my heart that she was stereotyping because I don't think that's true with all Sierra Leone men. They do get married. They, I mean, Africans, they are the most people that get married first. Like, you know what I mean? So I, for her to say that she was telling me that Sierra Leone men, they would, they don't, they not, they're not marrying like that anymore. And then she was talking about the other guy at our, at the other job she was talking about another co-worker who we work with how he's with this he's Sierra Leone but he's dating this African-American women they've been get they've been together for 10 years and not even thinking about marriage and the Sierra Leone guy said that she didn't want to get married the African-American woman didn't want to get married so maybe is that our fault maybe we need to be telling these men we need to get married or don't live with them until they matter of fact I'm not living with anyone until we get we got to get married first before we live together hey, that's Josh, just it you know if you want to buy him a car you want to build with him make sure he get it gets you married first before you want to do yeah, that okay yeah, Kay, uh, Kevin Sammy should talk about that one. Uh, women dealing with dudes that putting up with that and not um, them not being serious with them. But my main two things is this is from, again, this is from my reality. I think the first thing is like what you guys were talking about, and this is what I've realized, especially with American women, period, but um, especially black women, unfortunately. But, but I think that's mostly because of how their mothers raised them and stuff. So I don't really fault them um, per se on it but a lot of them don't really know how to recognize potential like so when they deal with a dude like you know um marie shy if i'm pronouncing that right and trina you know i I feel for them maybe they legitimately are burnt out but at the same time i wonder if the like maybe what they thought was potential in a dude wasn't a potential like maybe if me or Lumbamba or zongo if we saw these dudes we would have known as soon as we saw him like he's not worth investing into because i think a lot of uh, american women in general they don't really know uh what type of guys to invest in or what potential looks like i remember kevin sammy's gonna talk about that a lot too that like, you know if a good dude came your way you wouldn't even know how to identify him and two the dudes are taken in america i'm sorry well, i'm tired well, well, well okay and, and, well mr mr seattle i'm so sorry to um interrupt you but okay the current guy i'm with like i'm not trying to tell him my business but um he at first when i was talking to him he was working and he finished his law degree, so he has a law degree. But I guess something's going on in Sierra Leone. Sierra Leone they haven't gave them their diploma yet or something like that. He took the bar. He passed it. But it's something where he didn't get something from him, so he can't work as a lawyer yet. And so now, like, he's out of a job. And, like, I kind of have been helping him and stuff like that. But it's getting tiring. Like, I'm trying to be, you know, you know, be there for him and stuff like that. But it's getting tiring. Like, you know, um, not that I don't mind helping, but at the end of the day, I am burned out and I'm trying to be a good woman and be there for him and stuff like that. But he's going to have to do something. I'm sorry, because I can't keep doing this. So I like I'm dealing with that right now. You putting all your business out there tonight, ain't you? <laughs> well, well, this, well this, I mean, explain, Mary, because we could, we could, t- but what what I'm seeing is it seems like like Zongo Native. It seems like the African men to me believe in marriage, like they believe in family and want to get married. And from what I'm seeing, Black American men here in America, they all about some sex. To me, it's a coochie hustle. I'm just uh uh-uh. uh. <laughs> I think it's uh, um, <laughs> yeah, here's, 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 hey, but, hey, okay, so like, okay, I'm about to really go deep into it now. Here's the thing. All right, go ahead, brother. <laughs> See, this is my experience with this one, and I and I can again, this is from my perspective. But let's say me, uh, my friends, I went to college with, I'm still in contact with them. So let's say me and ten other black men, right? Out of all of us right now, even though we're about the same age range, none of us are even in relationships besides like three of us. The other seven of us, single, no kids. And I actually make the least money uh, compared to my, my friends. You know, they're either also working remote, uh, they live on the West Coast, whatnot. So it's not necessarily that, you know, all Afro, uh, Black American men 
you know, want or it's a coochie hustle. It's just that to be honest with you, from our perspective and from what I've dealt with, when you meet, and we're about to go back to the same old topic. When you meet a black woman nowadays, like most of them in here in the States, and you're a black man and you make money, again, like what I said with the Seattle thing, it's almost like, first off, a lot of them look for reasons for like something. Like, oh, like, okay, well, oh, yeah, he's making money. Okay, he's black. Okay, let me see if he's really about that. It's like the off rip, they already looking for a reason to disqualify you. That's the first thing. The second thing, let's keep it 100. We've talked about this a million times in the black ministry. A lot of them aren't checking for us on the. Uh, attraction side so you know they might hear the way i speak the way i dress like oh okay from this is what i'm gonna just keep it 100 from what i've seen from my perspective of most black women even the ones that got money and stuff they want like a future do in looks and and cadence and how he talks and shit and how he yeah. carries himself his swag but they want him to have the money of like a square dude mm. but you can't be just the future or just a square dude. It's like they want a mix. And unfortunately, what most of them don't realize is that most of these dudes that got money, head on their shoulders, whatever, whatnot, he's not going to be future. He's not going to be, uh, you know, Michael B. Jordan or something, most likely. That's my experience on it. So I'm not going to say all of them are like that because I have met some cool um, black American women, but it's just like culturally, it's like for a lot of them, they just can't get that tinge out of their head. Where it's like they need that dude with that street in him. Like, that's cool. Okay, you can have some street in him, but you can't. Um, most, I'll just keep it 100. Most of them just aren't attracted to those dudes that do have the money and head on their shoulders. That's my experience. That's why most of me and my friends were either dating now or we're dating women of different cultures. It doesn't mean she, they're not black because I've met plenty great black German women, even Caribbean women. Um, so that's just, I'm going to leave it at that. Well, keep it in with the diaspora. The right, I'm brother. dating. Keep it in with the diaspora, right, brother Seattle? Keep it with the diaspora, uh, much. Uh, you can. I, I mean, me personally, I, I don't really care. Like, I date all races, but, but if you, uh, I'm just saying, you don't have to. Just well, because wanna, you don't deal with a mere, uh, black well, American women, if you can still deal with black well, women, if that's what you want. Well, the guy I'm dating, he's he don't got no street in him or at all. Like he's he's from Sierra Leone. He doesn't have any. He's like he's a nerd, and like he he doesn't have any street in him. And I I think he's he's cute and stuff like that. But I just like it's just the right. I mean, and I should and I and I shouldn't be like this. I mean, he's living in you know Sierra Leone and stuff like that. And you know, I know how hard it is to find work there. I'm not you know I'm not trying to you know, but. I understand what you're saying, Mr. Seattle, but like he's he doesn't he doesn't have any street nothing at all. Like he's just a, a I mean, regular a, nerd black guy and stuff like that. Have you met him personally? I'm sorry. Yes, I, yeah, I, I I met him. Yes, I met him. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm gonna play, play, he... play this clip real quick and it speaks to what brother Seattle was saying. Because the reason why I'm saying that is because when I was goes, right, so <laughs> I, I think that that's what <laughs> Well, I, gotta, was yeah. too, right? I gotta say something. I gotta the comment. There was yep. a super thug who is also Johnny Kaufman, right? I, so I, I, wanted, I wanted to comment on Mary's uh, situation, right? Like Seattle was saying that you should be able to recognize potential in a man when you see that, right? So considering the fact that you went to Sierra Leone and you met him and you said he has a law degree, he has everything, right? I mean, if you, I mean, he, ha he doesn't have money. You don't have to give him much. You have you have to stop giving him money and see whether if he's still gonna like you like he he used to, right? And then if he still likes you that way, if you bring him over here, maybe he can has he can have the potential to succeed. And I'll say that from a typical. I'll use myself as an example, right? When I was in Ghana, I graduated. I didn't get no job when I was in Ghana until I went to. Uh, I came here to do my my master's degree. And I graduated, and I'm working as a permit engineer because I do have the potential. It's just that the opportunities was just lacking from where I came from at that particular time, right? So you should be able to recognize potential when you see that in that person, right? Instead of just thinking that maybe he's asking you too much money, if he comes, does he have the potential to succeed when he comes? Do you recognize that potential in him, right? If you stop giving no. him the money, if you stop giving him the money, is he still gonna, you know, interact with you or not? 
I mean, he should be able to see that whether he's trying to play you or not. I mean, just, you know, go along with him that way and, and see whether he's genuine or not. I've got to, no, I just don't. Have to say, let me, let me say this real quick. That from my experience, the brothers, the nerdy brothers that got their head on straight, that are educated and successful, they tend to go with white women or light skinned chicks or mixed chicks. I've seen this for oh, myself. Stop, stop the cat. No, I'm, no, I'm going there. I'm going there. I'm going there. I'm going for my. I'm going to back her up. I'm going to back her up. Eight percent of black men <laughs> are married to white women. We're going to stop <laughs> right now. I've seen this. I've seen this on the college campus. Once I'm, again, once again, that once again, that's what you saw. <laughs> What out of 23 million black men, only eight percent are with white women. So we're gonna stop the cap. <laughs> can't fight the number. Stop the cap. Come on now. Hold you can't say love ass it that now I will eight percent is and this is black. I'm I'm getting my numbers from blackdemographics.com. Black demographics for black people by black people. So we gotta stop this this ridiculous narrative that once a brother gets educated, he's running and checking for a pink toe. Let's stop the cap, for real. We, we, I'm okay, I, I, sir. Yeah. You come on my channel and you do this. Mr. The buck. Well, like, come on, well, like, I'm, I'm not oh, saying... Come on, now. I'm yeah, sitting back. I, know, I can see. Got a good buzz, sipping my wine. You had to get me back on camera. Come on, now. Don't do that. <laughs> Here's the thing, though. Like I, I've, I've talked about this uh, many times before. Now, for the young, my let's say my generation and younger, let's say people born mid '90s and up. For those of us that are educated black men, that may be true, but it's not like we hopped out of the womb and it's like, yeah, I'm only checking for white women. Now it wasn't like that. It was pretty much it was that way since we were young, and then like as we got a bit older, like it's just. It naturally happened in the sense of you learn. I was going to say this one earlier. You learn that you just because that, you know, they might be checking for the future type dudes. Okay, that's cool. Or you might. And I will admit a lot of these dudes like this is all racist. Like most like I work in tech. Most dudes that are in tech, not only do they not have game with women, their social skills suck. They don't know how to dress. That's just the nature of the beast with them dudes for some reason. Uh, myself included, uh, up until about a few years ago. <clears throat> but for the most part, what I'm trying to say is just because that our culture here is promoted like that doesn't mean that everywhere else around the world is like that. So if I use myself for an example, me and my friends, it's not that like when I was in elementary school, middle school, high school, I was like, yeah, I'm checking for white chicks. It's just that when growing up, they would just hear how I speak because of how my mom raised me and no, 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 no. Um, oh, yeah, I don't want you talking ghetto, blah, blah, blah. It's just that most black chicks, like as soon as I would talk to them or they would be around me, they just weren't checking for me per se. Not that I pushed them away. I was more so like on my end because I wasn't like the future type dudes. I, I actually remember my first memory when I was in elementary school is that I'm like reading a book with Miss me, my sister and a friend. And uh, it was like, well, a black boy and like a group of black girls. And they were like making fun of me for reading. I remember that at a mm. young and as I got older, middle school, high school is the same story. So it was not like us uh, educated black men just like one day we're just like, oh, we don't want black women. Just say like we kind of got engineered that way. And now we're just this way. So for me, I don't look at it as if I'm not checking for black women. Just say I get along better with, especially here in the States, for with non-black for sure. But wow. once I go to so Europe, so, so, so let me I ask you this, with, brother. Let me ask you this, brother of, Seattle. Do yeah. you have the ability to love a non-black person? What do you mean by that? Do you have the ability to love a person who is not black or of African descent? Yeah, why wouldn't I? Wow. I I'm asking because I don't have the emotional capacity to love a non-black person. That's well, what I'm well, I'll tell you what, as an African person myself, even myself, I don't have the ability to even love all African women, though. If I was in Ghana, I'll probably stick to the group where I come from, right? So I think the the idea is just projected 
uh, in a Western society that you have to stick to your race. It's not. It's not the same when you go to <laughs> Africa. People just don't marry yeah, with the yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, like well, you know Europe what? It's, that is true um, because um, before I even started to like be in these Pan African states uh, spaces. Um, I was even like starting to be into like starting to be like become attracted to white men because like wow. I went to white predominantly I went to well I went to white predominantly high schools Lamumba and this this white guy he asked me out for homecoming but I said no because I know how my mom was my mom was saying we need to stick to our own race and stuff like that even though my brother he dated uh, white girls and stuff like that but. I always listen to kind of like my mom. My mom always wanted us to stay with our own race and stuff like that. And this white guy, he asked me out for homecoming and I was just like, no, I'm sorry. I didn't want to go. I just told him no. But uh, like at first I was starting to become attracted to white guys because like I said, what I went through in middle school, like I had a choice if I wanted to go to Northland or if I wanted to go to Westville South. I went to Westville South, like to the white predominantly high school because where we live. Because, like, I was getting teased in uh, middle school, like, by black men. Like, you know, they were talking about my skin color and, like, you know, my nose and stuff like that. And, you know, I got, like, a broad nose and stuff like that. And, like, and I'm not saying all black men <clears throat> was but, like, teasing okay, and but, stuff like but, that. But, but, but I will say is this. Everybody gets teased growing up. It, if you, it doesn't matter if you're attractive, beautiful, ugly, tall, short, skinny, fat, in shape, out of shape. Everybody gets teased as a child. That's a reality. I remember when I was in uh, elementary school, I was in third grade, there was a girl that had a huge, huge crush on. She teased me about being dark skinned, told me look like, told me I looked like I was some Somalia. I didn't run into the arms of a white bitch. Yeah, but, 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 it, it, but, but I mean, but, but I but I never but I never fine. dated anybody white though. I never dated anybody white. So I did that didn't push me into a white. Guy, I just said I had an attraction for them a little bit. Like I had, like yeah, I had attraction for all type of guys, but I just had a. Wow. I'm just saying I had attraction for them too. So, so I mean, but I never dated. Them. So when you say attraction, do you mean that you you could look at a person and say that okay, that person's handsome, or do you mean an attraction in terms of in terms of you would gravitate towards those individuals? Well, I'm I'm talking about looks because I always always I like. I don't know. For some reason, I had like the Italian black guys. Like, I mean, I mean Italian white guys, like the one okay. with the dark hair and like, like, like a so, tan. And the like I always like that, those types. And, and the reason, and the reason why I ask that question is because I'm a man. I know that there are women of different racial and ethnic backgrounds that are attractive. I'm not blind. You know what I'm saying? That's why I ask that question in terms of you just in terms of just being a typical appearance. Or in terms of do you find yourself gravitating towards those type of individuals? But uh, like I said before, globally, we find that what 85% of people, irrespective of racial, ethnic background, marry members of the same, the same racial and ethnic group. So that's just a global phenomenon there. Although yeah. it's changing a little bit with Gen Z for sure. But yeah, I'd, I'd agree with that. But-, right, but Gen Z, if I could... Well, of course I can. It's my show, right? Uh, Gen Z tends to move in this time. Uh, Gen Z has a, really embraced this idea and concept of the social social construction of identity, right? So they kind of see identity as fluid and not static, and that you could really be whatever you want to be when you say you are that, and it could change on Wednesday, Thursday, or even Friday. So I think that plays a role with Gen Z. I, I mean, just want to say, like, I know how Mary Mary feels because <clears throat> growing up, I really didn't start getting play from guys until I was twenty one. I couldn't get no play because I was I was the chocolate girl too. I was a, I'm dark brown skin, so I was you ugly, you got big lips, you this, you that, and I remember um, one time I was in high school. And I had a crush on this guy. He was biracial, half black, half white. I had wrote him a note telling him I liked him and how I felt, and he didn't even write me back. And I was yeah. like, I was like, yeah, I think, yeah, I think the the African American culture about colorism within the community is very toxic, right? 
us in African. Like this is systematic. This is the system stemming down from our oppression here. It's this is the stuff I've been talking to you about, brother Native, that you keep saying we're blaming the system, but it affects us from day to day. Well, well, I mean, it, but, uh, but, yeah. but, the, but the only way <clears throat> colorism affects you is if you you buy into it. Like yeah. it, it isn't. This well, isn't. You, I'm, I'm talking to a guy. I like a guy, but come to find out, he doesn't like me because I'm dark skin, not because I'm a bad person, because I'm dark. He doesn't even know me, but because I'm dark, he doesn't like me. Yeah, but I think but, I, I think. But brother Lamumba, go ahead, sister. But, but but brother Lamumba, I, like even the guys that I different American men that I dated, I dated one. He kept on talking about my skin color. He was like, that's why girls like you. That's why I date light-skinned women, because girls like you, blah, blah, this. And then there was another guy. He preferred my hair to be straight instead of having my natural curls. And I'm right. like, I so, got so, tired so, so, of that. And so that's no, why no, I no. dated an African guy. That's why I, I, I dated an uh, African but guy. I, but I'm going to say this. I prefer women who are dark-skinned. I prefer women who are blue, black, purple, personally. Black as the fuck. Not black as the fuck. Black as the fuck, right? I've only dated women my entire life who wear their hair natural, mm -hmm. right? I don't date women who wear fake nails. So that is particular. That is particular to that individual man. That's mm -hmm. all I'm saying. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, this is this thing now that I mean, I mean, just a lot of that has passed on since we started talking. But my thing is, what I, in my opinion, it's less about. And by the way, my sister, I have a sister that's two years younger than me. She dealt with the same thing from. Uh, not from black men, by the way. She black guys um, have always been checking for my sister, but black women right, would man? always bully her about, "Oh, you're square. Oh, why are you listening to metal music? Or why are you reading? Why are you?" She was like the studious, quiet mm -hmm. girl, studying different languages and stuff. So she never got along with other black women because of that. But mm -hmm. black women, she black men, she never had an issue. Like she's, you know, she's not definitely dark skinned She's not light skin. Mm -hmm. But you want to know the main thing that made her stand out from all the other girls in her school? She was in shape, and she wasn't. She didn't. She didn't act. You know, right. crazy or dead or not. Well, so the, the the main thing I is I realized I post some pictures on my channel. <laughs> I'm in the gym five six days a week. It's rare that you will find black women working out in the gym. To most, yeah, and it's an issue. And Kevin Samuels <laughs> brought this up. 80% of black women are overweight, or and 80% of the women who are overweight are obese. But what the women are oh. overweight and obese because a lot of us are single and single parents, and a lot of black women have to go to work. We don't have the time to go to the gym and work out. No, I'm no, a no, no. But, 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 no, no, no. no but wait a minute, now. but during because his thing, but, you even do a, you could do a home workout. You could go on YouTube. They yeah, got you can. You could do it's with do eyes. Is with I yeah, remember, but, it's, it's African women. When I was in Poland, I saw these African all women, most European women work out here, no matter how busy they are. But I even but I, if we want to bring it to black women, it's African women out there that are trying to get their their citizenship in like an EU country, literally driving for. I met one black uh, African black woman driving for Uber for eight hours a day almost eight hours a day and she worked another job but she still found a way to, to stay in shape so yeah really it's just a priority matter of mm -hmm. fact love ass said well, i had i've had i've, I've had black women right. tell me it's rare to see me in the gym that is very true absolutely I, I i mean i work out religiously it's rare to find mm -hmm. sisters in the gym working out even if only 30 I, minutes yeah. but wait women, a minute i was if they don't play sports they don't they don't exercise at all for example my sister but, but, she, she ran track. My sister had the body of a sprinter. As soon as she stopped running track, she blew the fuck up. She looks like who in the blowfish now? Yeah. <laughs> well, well, to be well, to be honest, uh, but, but to be honest, I was when when those black men were saying it. I'm not saying all black men, but I was in shape. I was in shape really back then. I really don't. And to be honest, I really didn't think it was my color. Even though they said it was my color, I really think it was my facial features because there are really dark skinned women that are really pretty. But you see, like right. Kelly Rowland, she doesn't have broad features like me. Like, I'm just saying, like, so I really don't think it was my color. I really think it was my features because I was in shape. You know, I mean, I did have a little acne and stuff, but, you know, I really think it was my facial features. You know, not okay. all black men like broad features. So, 
Yeah, I mean, I think the problem, even when I came to America over here, I think the problem is, ha has a lot to do with the American system. I, I think a lot to do with the black community, African-American community. Uh, it seems to me they are too much infatuated with, with color, even with the way they describe uh, people in the English language. In the African language, the, the, the only time we describe so someone based on skin color is when you want to uh, pinpoint this particular person from the other person. But other than that... So real quick, Zongo, yeah. there's no such thing as a African language, right? You're speaking to a particular language that's spoken within your ethnic group in Ghana. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I speak like two, two languages in Ghana. So I mean, uh, within those um, uh, language, the Akan language and the Hausa language. The Hausa language mm -hmm. is, is very popular in West Africa, spoken in Nigeria, Nigeria. So I, yeah, I do want yes, to yeah, yeah, and it's more so associated with Islam, but Afro Af yeah. Africans who, uh, of course, speak uh, who are practitioners of yeah. the Islamic faith, absolutely. So I would tell the sisters if they go to Africa, they they wouldn't have that problem at all, at all. Even though like they have light skinned African si sisters and stuff like that, but I mean, it's, it, nobody in school, nobody will, will laugh at you based on your skin color or your face. Everybody look yeah. like that. In yeah, and Zongo, and, Zongo, and that's exactly why, and Zongo, that's exactly why I decided to date African men because when I dated African men, I didn't have to deal with that. Oh, she, you know, they didn't talk about my color or anything like that. They just liked me because they liked me. You know what I mean? And, I, and I'm not saying all African American men are like that, but I'm just saying what I went through, and that's why I decided to date African men. It's not just all of you. It's something that I even over here, uh, uh, an African American man that he told me personally that I do go outside with him to you know uh, to go and chill in Seattle and other places like that. And he told me personally that he he doesn't date black women. Why? Because he was bullied uh, when he was growing up. That's why he doesn't date black women. He only dates strictly with white women. He has kids with white women. But then that's weak as hell. Yeah, one time when he had a chance, <laughs> some some black ladies from illinois and then he told me personally even the the lady that he wanted to date probably would be the, the last skin lady he would he's not going to date those dark skin he himself is dark skin as well so i kind of like uh immediately i kind of understood that yeah there's something with the american system i i seen a lot of black guys over here in olympia that he told me personally that they don't date black women and for me it was like it was yeah. hard for me to, to to process that i'm like what why would you say that to me? I'm like, hey, I'm even good. if I don't like you, I'm not gonna say that for verbatim, right? It was just hard for me to process that as a, as an African, like navigating an American society within black people. Yeah. Then here's the thing, like, and I remember, and this is for both Europe and Asia, by the way, mm -hmm. as well as my friend that lived in Korea. I remember him, his Korean friends from Korea, tell him he. I'm gonna give y'all ten. It's gonna sound harsh. I'm just keep it real. He was in Korea and his Korean friends, he's black, his Korean friends told him, he remember, he asked his Korean friends eventually after he got cool with him, like, hey, how, <clears throat> how come you guys don't uh, date or, you know, get with black American women? And they said this about American women in general, but they, but they said especially black American women. And it's going to sound crazy, but they said that because of their weight, because most of them are overweight from their experience, they feel like that that for some reason, because, you know, most people in Asia, you know, they're slim and stuff. They're like, I'm not sure if, you know, I would fit <laughs> inside of her because of all the the weight or the fat or is um, just the overweightness was the main reason for it. And I remember I was hanging out with my Japanese friend in France. Uh, we were in France. And when we were around, he also studied here in, uh, not here, he also studied in Seattle at University of Washington, the same school I went to. And he, when he saw like lots of black women, um, like there in France, they were actually in shape together. And like he was, and I remember him telling me, he was like, I know it's going to sound crazy because we're cool. He was like, I know, you know, I'm not racist, but he was like, now that I'm around black women that are actually in shape and not overweight and, you know, have their natural hair. He was like, I'm, I think I'm actually attracted to black women again, or I'm actually attracted to black women. And that was crazy to me because on a subconscious level, I never like consciously thought about maybe, I mean, I know I talked about earlier how they weren't checking for me, but a big factor in the room was for me, even in the States, it was like, I just 
encountering black women and really, you know, at least yeah, like, I, mean, I, would say, I didn't come across it that yeah. often. So I wasn't really not attracted to black women, not because they were black, but was, I didn't find that me. I was just attracted to. But when I went to Europe and I'm seeing, uh, you know, Brazilian women that, that are dark skinned, African women and like that were in shape. I was like, wow, this is I felt like I was almost like around a different race of women. And their I, behavior and, say, and how they carry themselves physically. And I, and I would say this: I don't date women who are overweight. Yeah, never yeah, but, have, and I never but, will. Yeah, Lamumba, I, I know what I like and I know what I dislike. If but, you are ooh. overweight, you don't have a snowball's <laughs> chance in hell with me. Yeah, but, uh, I'm, 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 I'm out the loop, brother Lumber. I'm out the loop. Yeah, but <laughs> I, I, I said, if you're overweight, <laughs> you do it. I'm I'm out out the loop. Loop. I, I, I mean, yeah, the future. Um, look, the futures are checking for him, and, and guess and guess who are the main men that they complain about? Hmm. Yeah. A lot yeah. of like black yeah. men complain about black women's weight, but I mean, I've only been to like uh, three or four states: Missouri, Illinois, uh, um, and quite frankly, uh, even when I go to the gym when I was in Tilly Park, Illinois, I do see a lot of black women going to the gym. I mean, uh, when they do, when they say like black women are overweight. I asked myself, like, which state are they referring to? Because I haven't seen any so far, like the overweight ones. You haven't seen any? Yeah. Well, 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 yeah, I know I'm, I know I'm know i overweight. Okay, okay. Let me, let, let, let I'm 5'2", and I'm 200 right. pounds, so I know I need to lose weight. Let me correct myself. I mean, when I came, I stayed in a predominantly white society. When I go to black communities, I just go to visit and then right. go back. But how the sister love ass, you tapped in. I'm gonna give you a chance to speak about the gym topic. Well, whatever you want to touch on. Um, you tapped in, so I know you wanted to speak on something. So it's oh, up love to you. ash goes to the gym. But if it was the gym topic, go right ahead. Made me come back on. Come back to me. So yeah, it may have, it may have been the gym topic though, because I saw it on no, because I feel like I was. You posted a couple of pictures of you in there thugging. You know what I'm oh, saying? Oh, yeah, I go to the gym. Doing your, I mean, you're holding it down and everything like that. I mean, when, like, people tell me, like, in, to my face in the gym, it always surprises me. Like, oh, we never see black women in the gym. That always throws me off. But, I mean, hey, that's their Yeah, that's someone who is but, 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 real, though. You don't yeah, wait a minute, like, though. Yeah. Because be when, but, here. I'm like. Do we not, not be in the gym like that? No, y'all don't. Okay, be but 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 <laughs> but brother Lamumba, when I when I was going to the gym, this was like maybe like a year or two ago. Uh -huh. There was this Middle Eastern guy. There was this Middle Eastern guy. I was uh -huh. in there trying to lose weight. He was saying, you don't need to lose weight. He said, I like the way your body shape is. And a lot of people tell me that I'm slim thick. But I do not think I'm slim thick. I am, no, I am so, so big. His, but his, he was telling me I didn't need to lose weight. Let me speak to that. That's called dude was trying to smash. Yeah, Point <laughs> blank, period. Yeah, if you And I no disrespect, but if you're five to 200 pounds, there's no way that you're slim thick. Dude yeah. was saying that to you because he was trying to get those goodies. Yeah. That's, just, that's just what it is. Yeah, I, I'm 176 right now, and I'm even 5'9". Right. right and and like I, I'm six foot tall and I'm two twenty five, but a lot is muscle. Like I'm in the gym all the time. Yeah, you're absolutely right. So, like I said, I'm six foot two twenty five. Oh, if a man is telling you that, it's because he's trying to smash. That's just all it is. Yes. Yeah. Even the black women that I dated, they they're like they're way slim. Like they don't have like weight problem. <laughs> Yeah. But, but yeah. Luke, I, I think if I may ask, please, could we actually have a, a if you ever could do a forum on weight? Because with the Lizzo thing, don't get me wrong, I am overweight, but I've lost um, 40 pounds. Okay. I, but the thing is, I don't like how they're portraying Lizzo to be this mantra of obesity. Right. Like, I'm going to show y'all a picture of me to show y'all who I am, what I'm about. Let me, let me pull this up on my eyes. Uh -uh, unless you're trying to show out. Yeah, I'm showing out. This is Body by Lumumba right here. <laughs> yeah. Oh, shoot, okay. Okay, huh? Are well, you actually in that gym? I don't know. Yeah, okay. I told you I do this for real. Um, Not for play play. Are well, you actually in that gym? Yeah, I don't do this for play play. I do this for, for real, for real. 
and, and, and brother Lamumba, I mean the the jokes uh part about the black uh, the African American community that they do like um uh exhibit among like all the black um yeah I met like one lady over here um I think somewhere in Tacoma and she said that sometimes she she was from African American community and she used to lie that she's African because she she get teased all the time I was like what. Uh, I kind of felt sad for her. I yeah, and we, and we do have that in our community. There's some. No, I, used to, I, I don't think it's, yeah. it's it's really right. You know, yeah. that aspect of the culture it has to be denounced and it should be thrown away in the garbage. It's, it should have been tolerated. Yes. Absolutely, I agree with you one hundred percent. Absolutely, one hundred percent. So listen, we got ten minutes left, and then we're gonna wrap it up because it's one o'clock here on the East Coast, and I gotta take my little behind the bed, right? So uh, I'm gonna give you all a chance to give final thoughts on the conversation regarding the husband-son crisis, then, of course, how we extrapolated to, of course, the issue of working out, the, the weight. I'm going to do a show on weight. Why does it matter? Uh, so on and so forth. So I'm going to start off with Sister Michelle. Then we're going to go around and around, Robin, and close it out. Uh, thank you again for having this topic. This no is problem. a very serious topic about uh, the homosexuals and the um, the son husband. Is it son, son husband? I'm tired. Husband, sons, husband, husband, sons um, dynamic in the in the fa in the home system because this is not the norm. Um, right. It's just not the norm. Uh, again, again, like I said, no. this is attack on our warrior class as men. Um, now that we're here, I hope we as a diaspora can see this and we're having these discussions so we can have some real life solutions. Thank you. Okay, Zongo Nader. What say you? Final thoughts. Okay, Seattle side slideshow. Yep. Well, <clears throat> I think you know for the most part. Look, you know, birds of a feather flock together. You know, if you dealing with, if, right. you, if you don't want to deal with the, the hobosexuals, you know, maybe change up your. Your social atmosphere on both sides, men or women, you know, um, on the man side, I think, look, you know, uh, you might need to go into the K for a year and work on yourself, get your game up. So you don't got to keep <clears throat> so that you don't have to rely on women or anyone else to boost mm -hmm. you up. That's crazy to me. So right. I'll just say everyone, look, just, you know, raise your self-esteem, build your confidence up and level up. That's it. Absolutely. I like I like that. You will need to tap in more often, brother. Tap in more often. Indeed. Yeah, it was a pleasure. Appreciate it. Sister Shine. I really don't have anything else to say. Um, I just agree with Seattle, but that's it. Thank you for having me on. All right. No problem. All right. Sister Jackson. This was a good discussion. Mm -hmm. I am learning. I, I have learned a lot and I'm ready for more discussions like this. Absolutely. I, I, I might I might be back tomorrow. I, I know I got to um, finish working working on a chapter two of my dissertation because I got a great papers and stuff. Uh, but, if, but if I get things taken care of in a manner that I want to, I'm going to do another show tomorrow. So appreciate you, Sister Jackson. Love, Ash. I'm going to let you close this out. I don't have anything. Man, you always stunting. You right here. <laughs> Yeah, why you keep saying that? I don't have nothing. But hey, I appreciate you all. Appreciate you tapping in. Make sure you like, subscribe, and share. Until next time, you're watching the Mobile Speaks here on YouTube, a Black Empowerment Initiative where we believe in always betting on Black. Till next time, peace.